আর তোমার শুরু করে দাও यस স্যার সো আ ভেরি গুড আফটারনুন টু অল আর ডিয়ার স্টুডেন্টস এন্ড এন্ড দ্য এন্ড দ্য এনটায়ার অডিয়েন্স এন্ড ভি আর ভি আর অ্যাসেম্বলড হিয়ার अगेन ফর অ্যানাদার সিরিজ অফ দিস ইন্ডাকশন ওরিয়েন্টেশন প্রোগ্রাম uh conducted by the school of biological science and uh, on this day today we have with us uh two speakers and the first speaker is an eminent personality scientist in the field of uh structural and computational biology professor gautam basu from the bose institute kolkata and uh, after his talk welcome sir and after his talk we have our uh, alumni Dr Abhinav KV from uh, United Kingdom he is a post doctoral research associate from ISMB University College uh, London Burke Beck United Kingdom and uh, both of us are today going to give us some very uh, interesting uh, to, uh, seminar and it will definitely motivate our students the newcomers especially but um before we go into the into the introduction of our honorable um speakers i welcome professor dr shoykat moitro our honorable vice chancellor uh, who has agreed to um, grace this uh, occasion to introduce uh, him, uh, to introduce this uh, to the uh, to the students the purpose of holding these sort of uh, uh, talks and, and this induction and orientation program and to motivate our students so sir welcome you once again in your busy schedule we are thankful that you could make it and uh, we would like you to share your views and welcome our guests uh, today to this uh, webinar this webinar uh, has uh, two topics three pioneer women scientists of india and the second one is understanding the mechanism of antibiotic resistance so uh, sir uh, please uh, welcome our honorable um, guest today professor basu and with your motivating words you also welcome our uh, students and uh, welcome and introduce and also and sorry sir and also uh, open this uh, webinar thank you sir thank you are they only first year students or students of other years as well so we have first year and our ongoing students and our ex students also we have okay, tried to is, circulate it amongst our students yes sir we have done it it is not okay. induction it is a basically a webinar webinar yes so, uh, very good that uh, you have this webinar will be a very interesting topic so leading women scientist and then uh, so far i could understand that uh, mechanism of uh, antibiotic resistance these two are very important in the sense that uh, now we uh, we will be uh, coming to know about the contributions of this women scientist uh, in uh, i do not read indian perspective or international it is probably from indian indian women scientist okay so that's very very interesting and ins- that should be very inspiring for our uh, st- female students so uh, this is one thing secondly and this antibiotic resistance that is also very important in this context that um, uh, we are now consuming a lots of antibiotics without uh, considering you know this different you know this after effects or side effects and uh, for any you know this small problems uh, we are uh, being habituated in uh, taking up or consuming uh, numbers of antibiotics and many times without consulting the doctors also we uh, try to uh, you know this get all these things from medical stores and we consume it so this uh, uh, so We, all of us know that these are not uh, not a good thing so uh, as far as you know this human health is concerned but today scientifically it will be deliberated by uh, one of these uh, experts in this field and uh, my uh, heartfelt thanks to the department of biotechnology and school of biological science as they have uh, you know this taken initiatives in organizing this program and uh, this uh, speakers they are very uh, eminent uh in their fields and this will be very interesting lesson learning lesson for all of our students researchers faculty members and uh, i believe that this will be an engaging uh, you know this lesson for them engaging session for them and my best wishes for all the learners and i am requesting dr jaya bandavadai to take this session ahead thank you thank you so much sir for your uh, for this uh, welcome note and uh, we also would uh, love that you could join us in between within between your schedule 
so we will be happy to have you uh, in this session so thank you once again so yeah, uh, and i i also now welcome uh, our guest and uh, eminent scientist professor gautam basu he is in the he is actually an eminent scholar and and a scientist in the field of structural and computational biology and i think uh, to do the honors of the introduction professor raja banerji uh, is the only person i can think of and will do the best in introducing professor uh, basu in this uh, occasion and i think um, he i think uh, professor uh, banerji will be glad to introduce uh, uh, our speaker today to the to the audience and to the, our students per se so professor banerji it is now my honor to hand over and you can please uh, well, uh, introduce our speaker and welcome him to this webinar session thank you thank you uh, thank you dr bandopadhyay uh, for your nice introduction and actually this is a series of webinar we are going we are organizing on behalf of the school of biological science and uh, today i am feeling very proud and it's my proud privilege uh, to be with us with professor gautam basu who is basically a versatile uh, should i use the word genius i do not know because he never asked to anyone to call him sir rather to ask everyone to call him gautam or gautam da so we are use, uh, we are very much familiar with the term gautam da so he is a versatile genius in so many other fields and uh, everyone ever starts from some point and goes there so he is the first person almost to my knowledge in kolkata who started the structural biology and the protein protein folding uh, using the nmr concepts and all these things and now he is a legend in this field and actually backbone is basically the history starting point tradition so it is unfortunate for of all of especially for the indians who are basically forgetting and trying to forget their original history so today gautam basu uh, professor basu uh, who is basically started his career uh, from purulia shoinik school then he passed uh, his uh, graduate from the presidency college in chemistry uh, went to uh, iit kanpur got a very good rank and from there he moved abroad cornell university which is a very prestigious and very tough one of the toughest university in the world to get entry into that and after that receiving the phd from atsukuki uh, he uh, moved to japan uh, by getting a, another very prestigious fellowship called jsps and then from japan he landed to bos institute and where he started a new field the uh, protein folding protein concept etc and actually what he started in his career from that he did what he did not in his phd that is the molecular biology with few of his student he started the molecular biology but he today he is not here to tell about what he has done what he will tell us today to inspire to motivate us by telling us the history because history is the backbone of a society and unfortunately we the indians are trying to forget and we feel it is a status symbol if we copy and some western one but uh, my dear students i do not know how many of you know the name of the ganchandra ghosh but oh, so, some of you have heard about the uh, debye huckel onsgar uh, theory and basically the debye huckel onsgar theory is initiated by ganchandra ghosh he is a bengali unfortunately due to some uh, conceptual problem he at that time there was no internet but still he couldn't land it but his work even there is no internet it was actually creating a wave to the society of the western that western follows western follows not in the line of tagore poschima ji khuli ache dar shetha hote shobe ane upohar that time i jawa jagadish chandra bosu our acharya prafullo chandra rai and gan chandra ghosh all are there they are doing some science which is copied or which is taken care by the western people and they are getting towards the nobel journey so today professor gautam basu is here who will again here to uh, let us know 
and you by not the indian scientist male scientist but also about the female scientist in bengali there is a word called j radhe she chulo badhe so he is going to give you an idea about the three the pioneer scientists i am not uh, telling their names but he will start and once again go to the please uh, let us uh, enlighten with your uh, talk and actually i am telling you he is a very good orator he is not only doing science he writes so many uh, um, so many prose pieces so many uh, uh, besides scientific uh, world and published in so many uh, very reputed indian uh, uh, journals so he has so he can play congo, congo uh, bongo sorry he can play bongo and so other things are there so gautam da please <clears throat> okay uh can you hear me yes sir yeah. we can you are audible yes okay so hi hi everyone uh i'm my name is gautam uh it's unfortunate that i cannot see your eyes i cannot see who i'm talking to so i will assume i am talking to myself on my computer i'm going to share my screen and i am going to stop my video is that okay you don't want to see my face no i'm going to stop my video i want to share my screen and i am going to start can you see the screen Yes, sir. It is yes, visible, sir. sir. Visible. So today I decided to talk. I've removed the word "woman" from the title. Yeah, I think it's ugly. Uh, I think we are all humans. We are individuals, and uh, I, I just decided to change the title. And the title is called Three Pioneer Indian Scientists." I want you to understand the meaning of the word pioneer. Pioneer does not mean that they have done incredibly great science. Pioneer means a leader. Pioneer means you do something that nobody has done before. And I think all students, if I am talking to students, must tell themselves that they must see what is inside them and they should not copy anyone else. They should become who they are. Uh, and they can all become pioneers. I've decided to choose three pioneer Indian scientists that I like to talk about. One is, oops, one is Janaki Ammal, who is a botanist. The other is Bibha Choudhury, who is a physicist, and Oshima Chatterjee, who is a chemist. So today we're going to talk about three pioneer Indian scientists who happens to be women. Okay, a botanist Janaki Ammal, a physicist Bibha Choudhury, and a chemist Oshima Chatterjee. Let's start with Janaki Ammal. But before going to Janaki Ammal, what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you this slide, and what I have done in this slide. is i have shown the life span of these three scientists oshima janaki and bibha and superimposed them with the life span of cv raman shotendranath bose and hargobind khurana we know these three names so if you look at them you have an idea how contemporary these three women i am going to talk about today are with people who we know hargobind khurana got uh, won the nobel prize cv raman won the nobel prize shoten bosh did work worth nobel prize and what you see is janaki ammal was kind of at the same time born with sn bose and cv raman whereas ashima chatterjee and bibha choudhury is little later they are more contemporary of hargobind khurana what i wanted to understand by looking at this picture is that if you look at 1947 if you look at 90 sorry if you look at 1947 oops sorry if you look at 1947 that mark is 1947 so the three scientists that we are going to talk about half of their life was before independence 
and half of their life was after independence. And that makes a big difference. They not only did science, they also had to build a society. They had to build scientific temper. And often, more often than not, they were trained partly in the West, simply because there was no India as such at that time as an independent country. And after India became independent, they had to work for the country in some ways. Let us start with Janaki Ammal. You will see this picture. I don't know if you can see the, uh, the windows are moving. So these are drawn by a group of Indian artists. I'll talk about that later and uh, in Indian women in science. So I'm going to use pictures drawn by them. So Janaki Ammal was an Indian botanist who made significant contributions in the field of cytogenetics and phytogeography. Let us try to understand who she was, where she was born, and how did her uh, career you know, spread around time and across time and across continents. In fact, if you look at her uh, career, she spent quite a bit of time in India, she spent quite a bit of time in the US, and she spent quite a bit of time in UK. She was born in Kerala. She was born in Kerala in 1897. Remember, 1897 is the year when Jagadish Chandra Bose goes to England at the Royal Society and demonstrates his wireless device. 1895, he shows wireless transmission. In, so 1897 is, is a very, you know, I just want you to understand it's just not a number, what it means. That means Jagadish Chandra Bose is about 35, 40 years old. She was born in Kerala in a place called Telicherry. She did her schooling in Telicherry. Then she went to Madras. She went and did a graduation at Queen Mary's College and then did an honors in botany from Presidency College in Madras in 1921. After finishing her college, she started teaching in Women's Christian College in Madras. While she was teaching at this college, she got a fellowship. With this fellowship, she went to the US. She took this, got this Barbar scholar and went to University of Michigan in the US and did her master's degree in 1925. She returned to India and she continued teaching at the Women's Christian College. But after a year or so, she was invited back to University of Michigan as a Barbar scholar and went there and did her PhD. She was a, a, not a PhD, DSC, a doctorate degree. She actually was the first Asian woman to do a PhD in, in botany from the US. After her degree, she returned back to India and she started teaching in Trivandrum. So she went back to Kerala. She was teaching at the Maharaja's College of Science two years. After that, she moved to Coimbatore. In Coimbatore at that time, still there, there was a sugar cane breeding institute. It was actually called the, the Imperial Sugar Cane Breeding Institute. And she joined there as a geneticist. She worked there for four or five years. After that, she was invited and she moved to UK. In UK, she moved to John Innes Horticultural Institution and there she worked with a very well-known uh, geneticist called Darlington. He, she got stuck there because of the war. Remember, this is 4045. The Second World War started and she got stuck so she could not come back to India and she moved jobs another five years, 45 to 51. She worked as a cytologist at the Royal Horticultural Society at Wisley. Then after independence, she uh, accidentally met our prime minister, then prime minister Pandit Nehru, and Nehru invited her back to India in 1951. So 1951, she came back to India. And since then, she worked all through her life in India in various uh, you know, government uh, agencies, Botanical Survey of India, Central Botanical Laboratory at Allahabad, RRL in Jammu and Kashmir, Baba Atomic Research Center. And she, finally, she worked as an emeritus scientist at the Center for Advanced Study in Botany, University of Madras. Now, 
I'll just show you two pictures. This is a picture of Janaki Ammal uh, as a graduate student at the University of Michigan. This is another picture of Janaki Ammal right there wearing sari with <coughs> white Western men in England. Just to show you that her, 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 you know, she in the US as a student, she as a cytologist working in uh, the UK. Now, her research work really started uh, when she did her doctorate degree in Michigan. At the University of Michigan, she focused on plant cytology. Specifically, she looked at breeding interspecific hybrids and intergeneric hybrids. So without going into the details, all I want you to understand that her specialization was plant breeding, looking at hybrids, interspecific as well as intergeneric, uh, okay? At the Sugarcane Institute in Coimbatore, what she did is she did a lot of hybrids, but her main aim was to make uh, the sugarcane more uh, compatible with Indian conditions. So she took, he took native plant varieties and crossbred with saccharum in order to produce sugarcane crops. So she is considered to be the scientist who, who sweetened India. So actually still there are many varieties that was developed by her are still in cultivation now. Then she went at John Innes Institute. Uh, she, as I told you, she worked with a very well-known geneticist called uh, Cyril Dean Darlington. And one of the things that she did there with Darlington is together they published this chromosome atlas of cultivated plants it is considered to be a Bible, which provides knowledge about breeding and evolutionary patterns of botanical groups, okay? Then she went to the Horticultural Society where she studied botanical uses, for example, of colchicin. Colchicin is a small molecule, plant-derived molecule that actually can change the chromosome number from haploid to diploid to, you know, multiploid. And these uh, polyploidy of plants are related to quick growing plants and this and that. One of the results of our investigation is, the, is a magnolia flower and named after her. It's called Magnolia Kobas Janaki Amba. So this is this magnolia flower that was, there were other uh, flowers and species that were named after her. So this is Janaki. This is this beautiful magnolia shrub with flowers and a bright white petals in the UK. We move on and we come back to India. Back to India in 1951, Nehru made her a government appointed supervisor in charge of directing the Central Botanical Laboratory in Lucknow, okay? So in this capacity, what she did is she reorganized the Botanical Survey of India. Remember, the Botanical Survey of India was established by the colonials. The whole idea was to uh, document the botanical wealth of this country so that they can exploit it. The idea was to exploit India. And there was a Kew Gardens in Britain, that is how uh, they collected. So all the materials that were collected from here were taken there, there was nothing here. So one of the things that she did, this is his, her own writing, is that she said that for the last 30 years, foreign botanists are collecting Indian species and they are all sponsored by institutions outside India. And they are now found in various gardens and herbaria in Europe so that modern research on the flora of India can be conducted more intensely only. So as you see, what she's doing is they're building a country. They're building a country that was under colonial rule for a long time. And the colonials came and their, their only intention was to document natural uh, wealth of India so that they can be exploited. Now, later on, she worked on this for a long time. I don't want to go into the details. Also, I don't have time. After working decades on improving commercial value of plants by breeding, by focusing on genetics, she finally said the value of biodiversity. She looked at native plants. She wanted more and more biodiverse plants. She is really focused on diversity and preservation of indigenous plants. In the later years of her career, Amal lent her voice to a booming environmental movement called the Safe Silent Valley. I don't know if you know, in Kerala, if you go, there is a beautiful natural uh, reserve, natural park called the Silent Valley. 
At that time, there was this idea to set up a hydroelectric project that would flood the Silent Valley forest. What Janaki Amal did at that point, she, this is a letter he is writing to Darlington. She wrote large and long letters and a lot of letters to Darlington. I'm about to start a daring feat, she wrote to Darlington. I have made up my mind to take a chromosome survey of the forest trees of the Silent Valley, which is about to be made into a lake by letting in the waters of the river Kunti. Uh, finally, what happened was the Silent Valley project here was abandoned. The dam was not made and it became a natural reserve. Unfortunately, Amal was no longer around to see her triumph. She had died nine months earlier at 87 years old. So if you ever go to Silent Valley National Park in Kerala, and I'm sure one of you at some point of your life will go, remember about Janaki Ammal. She was elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Science in 1935. 1935 is the year when Indian Academy of Science in Bangalore was established by Sir C.V. Raman. University of Michigan conferred an honorary LLD on her in 1956. She was elected fellow of the Indian Science Academy in Delhi, Indian National Science Academy in 1957. Government of India conferred the Padma Sri on her in 1957. The Ministry of Environment and Forestry instituted the National Award of Taxonomy in her name in 2000. I just want to show you another picture of a flower. It's a rose. This rose is a hybrid. It's called E.K. Janaki Amal in honor of Anmal's life and work. If you ever go to John Innes Center in UK, in their garden, there is this rose. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on to the next scientist because I'm really not talking about Janaki Amal. I'm talking about three scientists. All are pioneers. I want to give you a flavor. That is the idea. We now next move to a woman called Bibha Choudhury. As you can see in this picture, I don't know if you can see, there is some kind of a glow that is falling on her face. And this picture again has been taken from Indian Women in Science. So Bibha Choudhury was an Indian physicist who worked on cosmic rays and elementary particles and who performed extraordinary experiments which led almost to the detection of mesons. So she and her mentor, DM Bose, Devendra Mohan Bose, missed the Nobel Prize a little bit. And the work was done in Bengal, up in the Himalayas, in Sandakfu. Uh, Bhima Chaudhary was born in Kolkata in 1913. She, there is not much known about her. She is a little bit of uh, a, a dark horse. Only recently a book has been written, a full book has been written on him. Uh, otherwise, uh, she was not well no known very well. So Bhima Chaudhary was born in Kolkata in 1913. Uh, she went to Bethune School in Kolkata. That's where her schooling was. Then she did her BSc in Physics from Scottish Church College in Kolkata. That was a time where women did not do go especially study physics. And uh, she was one of the early, very early pioneers. Then in 1936, she did a master's degree in physics from Calcutta University. Again, this is very pioneering. Even today, you don't see many women doing physics. And during that time, it was a very unusual feat. After doing her master's degree in physics, she decided to teach in a school. As she was teaching in a school, in a morning school, she decided to pursue research. She knew a man, she knew a man called Devendra Mohan Bose. Devendra Mohan Bose was a very accomplished physicist. He was J.C. Bose's nephew. At that time, he was a Palit professor at Calcutta University. This is a picture that uh, you will see often at many places. And I'm using this picture and that is DM Bose or Devendra Mohan Bose. That is uh, Jagadish Chandra Bose sitting. They are all Jagadish Chandra Bose's uh, students or you know, all of, mostly students. Right here actually is SN Bose. But anyway, Bibha Chaudhary knew Professor DM Bose. 
who was a poly professor at Calcutta University at that time. And the reason why she knew B, uh, DM Bose was DM Bose's wife was Dr. Nilratan Shortkar's daughter. And Bibha Choudhury's mother was Dr. Shortkar's wife's sister. I know it's complex, but it does not matter. What I'm trying to say is they knew each other and they knew each other because Nilratan Shortkar's family, Jagadish Bose's family, Bibha Choudhury's mother, they were all Brahmo. So this is a very key word. Being Brahmo actually allowed early, you know, women who went to college, who were allowed to study and go went to college where came from Brahmo background. So, so social reform in some ways helped women to enter higher studies. And also at Janaki Ammal, we saw Janaki Ammal also comes from Kerala. It's a matrilineal society. Also, she comes from a group where women were allowed to study. So it's very interesting to see if you correlate why and when the early uh, women were allowed to go for uh, 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 Bibha Choudhury knew DM Bose. When he went to DM Bose and said, I want to work with you, DM Bose said, sorry, there is no project for women with me. So it's very interesting how even though he knew, she knew DM Bose, DM Bose initially was not interested in taking her because she, he didn't think that women can do physics. But anyway, she did work with DM Bose. Finally, he did start his research work under DM Bose at Calcutta University. Now, 1937 is a turning point. 1937, Jagadish Chandra Bose died. Jagadish Chandra Bose was the director of Bose Institute. And after he died, Devendra Mohan Bose, DM Bose was made the director. So DM Bose moved from Calcutta University uh, to Bose Institute as the director. And, um, um, you know, Bibha Choudhury also moved with DM Bose to Bose Institute. This is a cartoon of Bose Institute from Amar Chitra Katha. Uh, if this is the, still this building is there, it's an active place. It's there at, on Raja, just beside Raja Bajar Science College. And what you see, what you read here is in 1917, when Jagadish Chandra Bose started the uh, Institute, he's heard talking from inside I dedicate today this institute, not merely a laboratory, but a temple. So both institutes are also historically very uh, important. So after demise of JC Bose, DM Bose became the director of Bose Institute and Biba moved to Bose Institute with him. And there together, they did some incredible work. The work was about mesons. To understand meson, let us look at the nucleus of an atom. If you look at the nucleus of an atom, you have a proton and a neutron, okay? If you look at protons, protons are present at the nu nucleus of an atom. Have, they all have positive charges. And we know positive charges repel each other, right? So two protons cannot be so close to each other. Yet in school, we have studied that the nucleus of an atom is so tightly packed that when Rutherford had, uh, you know, bombarded alpha particles uh, on a gold sheet, very thin, most alpha particles went through because it is empty. So how can two positive charges be, remain so close to each other? And, uh, and because we know the nucleus is quite stable. That's, that was a question being asked at that time. What special force is responsible for this stability? two protons being so close to each other, although both are same identically positively charged. At that time, Hideyuki Yukawa, he is a Japanese physicist who got Nobel Prize, he built a mathematical model. And that model could explain this, but the model had hypothesized the presence of a new elementary particle called meson. And the idea was, and this is just a model, you can think of, no, although it's not true, that meson is like a, uh, a particle that is getting exchanged between protons and neutrons and protons and protons. Now it's very easy to give uh, theoretical ideas, but you need experimental proof. 
unless there is an experimental proof, you don't know whether the model is correct or not. And this is where Biba Choudhury and uh, DM both started working. They looked at cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are rays that come from cosmos, Mohakash Takash. Cosmic rays that hit our atmosphere have very high energy particles that bombard atoms, which may eject the mesons, if, even if for a short time. So what they did is they went up to Sandak Fu. Many of you have, may have gone and trekked up to Sandak Fu. If you not, maybe you'll go. If you ever go up to Sandak Fu, trekking from Darjeeling, think of Biva Choudhury. So during 1939 and 1942, Bose and Choudhury exposed half-tone photographic plates in the high altitude regions of Darjeeling, Sandakfu, and at the Sikkim-Tibet border, there's a place called Farijong. The idea was to keep the photographic plates. If cosmic rays fall off them, then they will leave a track. And by analyzing the tracks, they can find out the mass of the atoms. And there was already a predicted mass, charge by mass ratio. And if the charge by mass, mass ratio uh, matched, then they know they have detected the meson. And what they did is they did observe long curved ionizing tracks that were different from the tracks of alpha particles or protons. They calculated the mass of the particles from the trajectories and concluded that these were mesons. They published one paper in Nature, photographic plates as detectors of mesotron showers. Second paper in Nature, origin and nature of heavy ionization particles detected on photographic plates exposed to cosmic rays. Third uh, 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 article in Nature, fourth article in Nature. There are four, two double authored papers that came out in Nature from Kolkata, one after another, 1940, 1941, 1942. After that, of course, Biva also published more papers. The problem was, however, unsurmountable. The problem was that their half-tone photographic plates were not good enough for the kind of sensitivity they required to show for sure what they were seeing was what they were seeing. They needed you know, full-tone photogra uh, photographic plates, but they were supposed to come from Europe the war stopped their transportation. So they could not have access to full tone photographic plates and they had to abandon their experiments. Seven years later, following the same principle, C.F. Powell won Nobel Prize in physics in 1950 for photographic method of studying nuclear processes. Fortunately, C.F. Powell <coughs> was generous enough to acknowledge saying Bose's work, meaning Bose and Choudhury, <coughs> first showed that one can distinguish between the tracks of protons and mesons in an emulsion, and it is possible to derive the mass from these tracks. Now, Bibha, due to problems in getting materials to carry out quality research, DM Bose decided to discontinue the field of cosmic ray research. Bibha Choudhury left India. Even though he, she published so many papers, she did not do her PhD here. She was, I, it's not very clear why, but she left India and she went to UK. She went to Manchester and she joined the group of Patrick M.S. Blackett. Blackett also got Nobel Prize. She joined her lab and uh, she started working on cosmic ray showers. She got her PhD there she returned to India and she joined TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. She was the first woman scientist to join TIFR. Then under Vikram Saravai, Vikram Saravai is considered to be the father of Is ISRO. When Vikram Saravai, with Vikram Saravai, he moved to physical research laboratory in Ahmedabad in 1957. He partic she participated in experiments deep down in Kolar Goldfield experiments. They were looking at elementary particles tracking deep down. And when those experiments were finished, they were uh, planning experiments up in Mount Abu. But at that time, Vikram Saravai passed away, uh, uh, untimely death. And after Vikram Saravai's death, she returned, she, she took a voluntary retirement from uh, PRL. She came back to Kolkata. She spent time at Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics. She also did collaborating work with 
scientist from Calcutta University and Indian Association for Cultivation of Science. She died in 1991. Her last paper was in 1990. This is a copy of her thesis. It's called uh, Extensive Air Showers Associated with Penetrated penetrating particle. She uh, got her PhD in 1952. Uh, this is a picture of Viva Choudhury right here in Italy uh, at the international conference in, uh, in Pisa. I just want to show, uh, end the Viva Choudhury part with this news. I don't know if you know this. Last year, 2019, December, a, a star called HD 8608 was named after Vibha. So this star called, which used to be called HD 8608, it is in the constellation of sextants is named after Vibha. So if you think of Vibha Choudhury, and if you think of if she was recognized, she really did not get any recognition. She was not elected fellow of any society she did not get a fact, she didn't have a faculty position anywhere. And in some ways, uh, she has been rediscovered recently. But I just want you to know that there is a star up in the sky uh, named after her. We move to our last uh, scientist, Oshima Chatterjee. Oshima Chatterjee is an Indian chemist who worked extensively on the chemistry and structure of a wide range of natural products and a focus on their medicinal values. Uh, Oshima Chatterjee was born in Calcutta in 1917. By the way, 1917 is a very interesting year because that is the year when Jag uh, Jagadish Chandra Boshu uh, established Bose Institute. She went to Bethun, uh, uh, she, she uh, went to Bethun school and finished her. So Bethun has been a very, very uh, uh, important uh, place, I guess and completed her graduation from Scottish Church College with chemistry honors. Uh, she obtained her master's degree from Calcutta University in 1940. She was uh, one of the earliest uh, Indian women to get PhD. Remember if, uh, so in 1940, uh, Viva Chaudhary was working, she could have got a PhD, but she did not uh, you know, uh, get, uh, apply for a PhD here. So anyway, uh, um, Oshima Chatterjee, one of the earliest science graduates from Indian University, women science graduate. In 1940, she started research after her finishing her master's under the guidance of Profullo Kumar Bose. By the way, at that time, in Calcutta University, Profullo Chandra Rai was also there. So she also interacted with him and he actually organized a little bit of fellowship for her. But those are details, I don't want to get into the details. And she started simultaneously teaching at Lady Bremont College. In fact, she started the chemistry department at Lady Bremont College. Uh, she obtained DSC degree from Calcutta in 1944 and was immediately appointed there as an honorary lecturer in chemistry. I just want to say that Viva Choudhury and Janaki Ambal were single, they did not marry. And so they could do whatever they wanted to do without much pressure from family. Uh, Oshima Chatterjee married, and she married someone called Borodhananda Chatterjee, who was a renowned physical and soil chemist. And I think a bit of credit should also go to Borodhananda Chatterjee for allowing Oshima Chatterjee to pursue science to the fullest. They have one daughter, Julie Banerjee, who is also a, a well-known uh, chemist. Now. In 1947, so I just want to say that uh, she, uh, in 1945, uh, 44, she started working in Calcutta University. But in 1947, what she did, she went on a study leave for three years. First to the United States, then to Europe. In the United States, she worked with a man called L.M. Parks at the University of Wisconsin. And with Zeckmeister, at Caltech, California Institute of Technology, who was a leading worker in plant pigments and chromatographic technique. Later, she went to Europe and she was in University of Zurich with a Nobel Prize winner called Paul Kerrer. Paul Kerrer is well known for his work with biologically active alkaloids. And we will see how he also worked with, she worked with alkaloids and other stuff later. 
In 1954, she was appointed reader at the department. She came back. She became a reader, Department of Chemistry. And 62, she became the Khoira professor, a chair she held until she retired in 1982. After her retirement as Khoira professor, she continued as the honorary coordinator of a center called Center for Advanced Studies of Natural Product, which she established herself till the last days of her life. She passed away in 2006. What I want to show you is two pages. The first page is on the left, second page is on the right. The first page is her, a list of publication that she began with. And the second page on the right is a list of publications she ended with. If you look at this, her first publication is 1937. Her last publication is 2007. That is incredibly long. 1930, what is 1937? She was born in 1917. So when she was 20 years old, she published her first paper. This is 2007. She died in 2006, 83 years old. And her last paper was published one year after her death. So almost for 60 years, she continuously published papers. She published about 330 papers. She supervised about 60 PhD students and three DSC students. She edited uh, six volumes of revised edition of Bharotir Banoshudi, a treatise in Bengali that deals with Indian medicinal plants. And another six volumes of the treatise on Indian medicinal plants. This was published by CSIR. Apart from publishing the results of her research, she is credited with establishing a school of natural products chemistry in the country. Just like Profullo Chandra Rai is credited, if not for anything else, for starting a school of chemistry in India, I think uh, she is credited with starting the school of natural product chemistry in our country. If you look at natural products, she worked with alkaloids, she worked with coumarins, and she worked with terpenoids. What did she do? Let us look at few alkaloids that she worked with. These are few alkaloids I've shown. So what, these are all alkaloids that she established, she isolated them and she established their structure. How do you establish the structure? You did not have nuclear magnetic resonance or other spectroscopic tools at the beginning when she started. So the way you do it is you degrade them, you make into smaller pieces, you identify them, and then you go back and do a total synthesis of the whole molecule to see if you can really reconstruct the original molecule that you think came from. So what I'm trying to say is that it's, it was quite complex. And so these are some of the alkaloids that she worked with and est established their structure. This is some of the coumarins that she worked with and established the structure. This is some of the terpenoids that she worked with and she established structure. So this itself was a enormous task and she continuously did, did this one after the other. She also did total synthesis and mechanistic studies of new molecules. This is an example of a total synthesis of a molecule called rau wald -Sin. And this, as you see, it comes from here and then it comes down here if you're not a chemist. And it looks very beautiful and easy but when you start, you only know the end point. You come up with starting materials and you follow roots, you follow roots. And so the nitrogenous part of this alkaloid, an alkaloid, this nitrogen was incorporated through uh, something called the uh, tryptamine, okay? But anyway, I just showing you, you know, uh, nitty gritty details of some of the work she did. This is another example. This is another example where a novel synthesis of this coumarin uh, uh, from cinnamic acid was reported, where a key step was a bare villiger oxidation of the intermediate. She uh, also worked on medicinal properties of many natural products. Uh, I just give you two examples. One is a drug called Ayush 56 that is still uh, being used now. This, the active principle here is called marcelin, which she showed uh, to have uh, a, a epilepsy, a anti epilepsy effect. This uh, was uh, isolated from water ferns. There is another Ayush 64. 
the exact composition is uh, of commercial value, therefore not uh, uh, revealed. It's with Indian government. This is also this has anti-malarial properties. There are many others. I don't want to get involved here. This is not the point. This is not a place to talk about details about what she did, but an overall idea. So she received the Shanti Sharu Bharnagar Award in 1961. She was elected fellow of both the Indian National Science Academy and Indian Academy of Science. She was, uh, she got the Paddo Bhushan. Uh, she served as the general president of the Indian Science Congress. She was the first woman president. She was a member of the Rajya Sabha for eight years, nominated by the president of India. She played a significant role in formation of science education policy in our country. Now, I think I'm more or less done with this, but what I wanted to show, I also want to have some discussions if, if you want to have one. Uh, there are many place things that I use, many references. I just want to show that I use mostly an article from Smith, Smithsonian Magazine on uh, Janaki Ammal. I use this book, A Jewel Unearthed by Rajinder Singh and Suprakash Roy on uh, Viva Choudhury. And this uh, article in resonance, it's called Oshima Energy, a Unique Natural Products Chemist by Ashish Day, I used. I just wanted to show you some more pictures of women scientists that I did not talk about. This is Kadombini Ganguly. She's a pioneer in many spheres. Kadombini Ganguly was the first female to practice Western medicine and the first to attend college in India. This is Suniti Solomon, a pioneer of AIDS research and treatment in India. She battled against the stigma attached to HIV patients, was, a, was as a great leader and scientist who not only saved but improved countless lives. This is Anna Mani. Anna Mani is called the Weather Woman of India. She was a renowned physicist, meteorologist. She worked at the Indian Meteorological Department and she served there for a long 30 years. This is Kamal Ranadive. Kamal, uh, Rana, uh, Kamal Ranadive is an Indian biomedical researcher who established India's first tissue culture lab studying pathophysiology and various cancers and leprosy. This is Anandi Joshi. Uh, she was the first Indian woman to receive a degree in Western medicine. This is Irawati Karve, the first woman anthropologist of India, did a lot of work in Burma, Myanmar, who used physical and cultural anthropology to characterize society structure. This is Rajeshwari Chatterjee. He was in ISC, a pioneer microwave engineering lab in India, making significant contributions in antenna engineering. This is Ritu Karidhal, an aerospace engineer. She's still alive, who aimed for the stars and reached Mars and the moon. There is no end. And I would want all of you, whether you are a teacher or a student, to go and look at this site called Women in Science. This is Orgho Manna. Orgho Manna did a lot of uh, the, the uh, paintings that I showed here. It is not just paintings. I think it is extremely important to understand, to appreciate, to know about people who work. I think it is high time we should stop hero worshiping. It is not just Shottin Bose and Jagadish Bose and uh, Sri Viraman. There are many people who do science. And we, anytime you do good science, you may not be able to do incredibly good science, but you can be a pioneer. And in India, what we need is pioneers. We don't need followers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Basu. That was a wonderful deliberation. I was mesmerized. Uh, in fact, this is the first time did I'm... I over, did I overshoot my time? Or I don't know. I no, 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 not at all, not at all. But I'm I just very... want people to realize that India is not just few icons. We are all there and we all, and it is time to study, read, and there, and there's art. The art is incredible. And I think it makes a big difference. Absolutely. Absolutely well said, um, Professor Basu. I think uh, before we, uh, I go move to Professor Banerjee. Welcome, uh, Abhinav, Dr. Abhinav. Hello. Hello. Uh, he's he is our alumni and well known to all our teachers. And uh, we are very proud to have with us another structural biologist, 
uh, and of course, Professor, Professor Basu did not um, uh, mention much about his work, but uh, Professor Banerjee is there. I think he would like to share a few, few of his experiences with Professor Basu. And, uh, and also, the, Abhinav, you will be uh, definitely, you are going to share your views about your uh, scientific uh, achievements um, where amongst our students. They would look forward to their seniors. And um, of course, uh, Professor Basu, your talk was excellent. But before we, we move on to the next talk, I think Professor Banerjee would like to share his views. So Professor, over to you, Professor Banerjee, if you can, uh, if you can uh, share your views on this uh, talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yes, yes. Okay. Actually, Actually, when I was uh, listening to Dr. Basu, or uh, go, rather to say Gautam Da, uh, it is, I, I was thinking, it is nothing but a tribute to Indian scientific history. We are just, it is a tribute to Indian scientific history. And we should say, we, we should say that Indian, as an Indian, we, sh we must have to follow, but we are also potential enough to do something. So our history, our background is very strong, but we are not looking at them. But I'm extremely, extremely privileged and happy uh, to enlighten us, to enrich us. Professor Basu, once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, this will help. I think this will help our student for generating a self-respect to go through a little backward, to understand their history, to learn their history through which they can build their future. So without the past, no future can be done. So I think you are doing the line of missing link today. So thank you once again, Professor Basu, for coming here and giving this or enlightening us or enriching us rather through the tribute to our scientists. I want to mention what Gautam that started, not as a pioneer female scientist, because I was with uh, in Calcutta University 91 to 93 when Professor Chatterjee was there. And if someone said, Madam, she was very angry and annoyed. She, we are asked to, we are told to call her master. She was very much saying, don't, don't distinguish, discriminate and distinguish male and female. Call me master. So we are habituated and this is, when he started, Gautam Dha was starting the word, I am uh, deleting the word female. I was just thinking about that. So basically, I saw her. I just spent, not the, in research lab, but the natural science, uh, in the natural chemistry. I also did my uh, MSc from there. So I have seen her even at the age of more, around se uh, more than 65, 70 how he is, how she was, basically, how she was working and how she was dedicated to science. So thank you once again for just taking me to that uh, age of 91 to 93. I can see, I can visualize, and I also, I'm also very happy to say that Biva, this means light, and she missed the Nobel Prize, but she has in the star which is basically giving us light. So I have also, I am also fortunate enough to see her because from Presidency College, we go went to um, SINP for some days, some thing at that time. And I also saw her, but I didn't know that time she was like star. So today I, we came to know uh, along with all others. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Gautam, Dha, for telling us our history. And I hope in the next time you will tell us some more. So don't go for hero ship, but there is also some, everyone is there. We can, everyone, we can be contributing and everyone can contribute and that will help us to generate self-respect. Well, un unfortunately, I didn't get to see who I talked to. That's the problem. <laughs> this is the problem of the online, Vic, but... Do okay. you have, are you taking questions from your students? Yes, yes, that's exactly, yeah. yeah. We have some questions. And um, uh, Dr. Vasu, you, if you can also, you will be also uh, 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 visualizing those questions. If you can check into the chat box. 
uh, baby you may okay. be able There's to see some, or i can read them out if you have can you read them out if there is any yeah yeah sure 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 so uh, i can see uh, debushmita chakraborty uh, she wrote uh, that cytogeny is a study okay she she was trying to uh, uh, describe what uh, plant cytology and cytogeneticist uh, they work with so that was not a question she was trying to define now diptayon odhikari he is asking how can the cytological parameters be used to differentiate two species of the same genus so um, i think uh, i'm not an expert okay then <laughs> it is all taxonomy and nomenclature so you have to actually go through those uh, features and uh, there is a separate uh, it's a separate science altogether whoever deals with taxonomy they know much better so there is uh, institutes that deals with all these um, plant products i uh, plant uh, species ask, yeah ask your biology yeah. teacher at macau <laughs> yes yes that's basically biology okay and uh, they are all very much um, moved by your talk everybody is uh, all everybody... i want to say is that uh, art is very important without yes. art you cannot do science Absolutely. and i think one of the things i wanted to emphasize was the art and uh, i hope in macau you allow your students to do art and science together right i hope you don't force them only doing science no 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 there are even there are even events uh, the, the whereby we, uh, we we invite the students to take part in such uh, these type of it may be competitive uh, there's a competition and all because without competition students might not be motivated they want to uh, secure some rank or that, that sort of things but yes we do have and i think uh, i'm more moved by the illustrations by orgo manna which you have it was wonderful it was really very apt to to this uh, lecture today and you have moved uh, from one uh, scientist to the other like from uh, uh, from uh, janaki ammal i think uh, abhinav is here he would be knowing more of uh, janaki ammal because he hails from the same state kerala so he he should be very proud i don't know you have missed the first part but it was wonderful that uh, she was there uh, who has uh, who has sweetened the 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 indian science that was wonderful we have we have learned a lot today many many unknown facts which we have uh, we i have at least learned a lot and i think um, others will agree even the students will agree it was really well well documented very precise there was much maybe if we had more time we can share with other scientists from you Dr. Basu, you have to give deliver the lecture because it was mesmerizing. I was mesmerized by your deliberation. I, I, I hope I told the introduction. He's a very good orator. Absolutely, I heard. But today it was the first experience that I have, and I'm really fortunate. And thank you, Professor Banerjee, to invite him today. And uh, definitely, he has uh, he has covered uh, a lot about Bibha Choudhury, the star there up in the sky. and uh, ashima chatterjee actually dr basu when the when the title was there the first person uh, that hit my mind was ashima chatterjee and i was wondering whether she will be covered and i'm very happy that she was there but yes nonetheless there were many other scientists which uh, we, you could not cover in this uh, short span but that pioneer pioneering research that was wonderfully uh, explained by you and i'm really thankful on behalf of uh, the school of biological science and macau west bengal we once again thank you for this wonderful uh, short but very crisp and nice uh, uh, lecture that you had offered for all the new students because that is more important and you are always this is really uh, encouraging encouraging this is really encouraging and, uh, absolutely and what he mentioned that i cannot see the eyes that is so true so this is absolutely true that when we are in classroom we need to look at their eyes to feel the 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 teaching and the learning the entire thing is all some emotions which is attached so that is missing but uh, we will we will not miss out you coming to horinghata and uh, there you will have a, a absolutely some first hand uh, experience with their eyes so thank you very much if you have anything to share uh, to and uh, your views to the new students because that would be more more encouraging and more illuminating because mostly this pro program is for the newcomers there is nothing to share except one thing 
that uh, whether you are a student or a teacher, you have to look inside. You have to find out who you are. And you have to follow yourself because you cannot run away from yourself. You can run away from anybody else. And that is the whole idea. And I think when you come to a college or a university, you know, what do you learn in a college? There's nothing to learn because everything is there in the book. A teacher is not teaching you something new. The teacher also has read it from somewhere. But I think in a college, you meet friends, you, you, you expose yourself to a very diverse group and you finally find out who you are. And I think that's all I would say to the students. And, uh, and I personally don't like examinations. They are disgusting uh, because everybody is different. Even the last girl is, can be a pioneer. So don't take, don't, you know, don't, that's what I would say. Don't spend too much time on how much marks you got. I'm not saying fail, but I think what is more important is, uh, you know, if you are being truthful to yourself. Uh, Gautam, uh, as you, uh, Gautam, as you want to know, uh, through the eye contact, what is the student's interaction? Actually, we are sorry, we cannot show you. But uh, I got a, a few messages in my WhatsApp. I just read it. Uh, I hope you can understand. Sir, uh, today's webinar is, is which we never heard in of, uh, uh, before. So we, uh, the second one wrote, actually, it helped us to learn who we are. I think yeah. these are the two comments. I think that is I, I, the whole point. You know, a student comes to college to find out who she is. Anyway, I have to go. I'm sorry. I have a meeting. Uh, I hope it's okay. Yeah. I, I hope this two words is good for you to learn. Yeah. This is the I, I, second one, which is also uh, very uh, helpful for me. To, I am also telling to know from your words who we are. This is the very catchy word. And that should be the word for us but uh, okay once again thank you thank you very much for thank coming you. here accepting you. accepting our uh, invitation and giving time and i think if the students can meet you uh, just uh, in a one to one interaction it will be very helpful for them uh, if uh, i i hope you won't mind to come to our institute and i am very much thankful uh, to you because uh, you often now all or some other students can say uh, who are you arrange some of their trainings in NMR machine uh, wh whom I take but this is for because of you without money I can uh, I show them at least a few experiment there thank you thank you very much thank you thank you yeah thank you thank you so much I'm going to switch off if you don't okay. mind okay bye 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 here yeah. I'm going to miss your talk. You can yes, unmute. No, we will catch up again sometime. <laughs> okay. where, where are you located right now? I am at UCL and Birkbeck. I see. This is London, University College London, yeah. yeah. Where is your... uh, I hope Avinav also went to Bose Institute with me to yes. do the NMR experiment. My journey for biophysics started yeah. with Professor Raja Banerjee and interaction with you. No, and, no, forget uh, about that. But I am telling you, you, went to, you, you have visited. Yes, yeah, the Bose Institute I'm, for I'm doing experiment, the and yes. the and the man behind is doing this arrangement without free, uh, completely free of cost. Is this Gautam Basu? Uh, yes. So, uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Abhinav. I'm sorry, I have thank to be. I have to go somewhere else. Yeah, no problems. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah. So that was wonderful. Uh, it was a great so, lecture. I'm now I, taking. A, I'm now taking. Uh, uh, the <laughs> mic from Dr. Bandhapadhyay because I think it is better. Dr. Bandhapadhyay should introduce Ovinav, uh, yes. whom I also see uh, not only in Macau but also in IISC Bangalore in the Professor Vijayan's lab. And actually, Dr. Ovinav, now I'm I can tell you, uh, you were in that time in IISC Bangalore for the interview. You came to my room. Uh, I hope you can remember this thing. Yes. And the, after the second interview at the same time, Dr. Vijayan asked me. Hey, you know this guy. I I told yes, you can take him. So this is the uh, some key story I am telling you, and okay. you prove yourself. This is nothing. I am not there. 
but I am very happy that you prove yourself in IISC, which I feel as a place of Indian uh, science, which is a temple. As uh, Jagadish Bose told, a tribute it is a not a house, scientific. As uh, so science building, it is a um, temple of science. So you, I myself consider the IISC as a temple of the Indian science, and you prove yourself there. And the Professor Bijan, who has a, a basically who is a structural biologist, one of the pioneer structural biologists using the X-ray crystallography and doing all the protein crystals, etc. And there are so many legendary figures. Rahul Banerjee, one of your teacher, was your ex. Uh, or the alumni of your group, so many others are there. I know everyone, so many ones. So now I hand it over to Dr. Bondupadhyay. Uh, <laughs> so start you with your journey from Macau to IISC, now to UK. I, I will. That's yes, right. yes. Very Thank, nice. you, Thank, Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. Very good, good to see that students yes. are, uh, our students are established. Exactly, exactly. There is, there is, it is undoubtedly a very great moment for all of us. And uh, I welcome Abhinav uh, to this uh, panel uh, today. And uh, to all the students, um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Abhinav KV, uh, he is your, uh, he is your C, super, 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 super senior, the way you call your seniors. Uh, because super senior, I never heard before, but uh, after coming to Macau or WBUT, uh, I heard this word super senior. And it is very popular amongst all the, all the students, I believe. So, so Abhinav, year, uh, Abhinav, which year? 2000? That's 2008, 2008, 2008, 2008 batch. 2008, 2010. Okay. So, this two and years. Yes. Yes, 2008 uh, to 2010, these two years, Abhinav, uh, he spent uh, a good time with us in uh, the Salt Lake campus of our university. Last time you heard Debo Jyoti. Debo Jyoti was one year senior to Abhinav. So but before, uh, before we, I go, introduce you, I am very happy that you have agreed to, to, uh, to talk before our students, especially the the, the newly admitted students. And you know, Abhinav, that this is uh, a kind of a, an orientation and induction program where uh, we have uh, brought in many scientists who will motivate the students and more particularly the alumni, especially uh, those in science can, uh, can also do a, a wonderful job in, 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 in this, uh, in waking up or making all the students enthusiastic about science and the field they choose to work with. They have embarked upon a, a new journey altogether. So you, you are sort of a, a torch bearer or a forerunner to uh, motivate them. But uh, th thank you so much, Abhinav. And to all the students, I have a small brief. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Abhinav to, before you. So he did his, um, his uh, bachelor's in biochemical engineering from Kerala, Kerala University. And uh, then thereafter, he moved to uh, WBUT now, which is Macau, the West Bengal. And he completed his uh, two year uh, MTech in biotechnology from us, under us. Uh, in fact, Professor Banerjee and me are the two, um, two remaining teachers who are there. And we had a wonderful time, definitely. I, I believe uh, you will also have to share, you have many things to share with them. And uh, to all the students, so after completing his MTech from here, he moved to um, uh, IISC Bangalore. And there he, there he, he, uh, he pursued his PhD and he moved to the molecular biophysics unit over there. That's all uh, different, different units you have in IISC Bangalore. And he did his PhD in X-ray crystallography and mostly focusing on the structural biology of plant and animals. And, and the mycobacterial lectins, which I, which I understand is going to also uh, be emphasized in his talk today under the able guidance of uh, Professor Vijayan and Professor Murthy. And uh, what I understand that he has uh, a lot of accolades under, his, uh, under him and those are, he has uh, got a gold medal for, for topping in his uh, university, in Kerala University. And also, uh, he has uh, the best poster award in the 18th International Biophysics Congress in Brisbane, Australia. That was wonderful. Congratulations. And the most 
a star, um, the most um, significant uh, achievement that you have that Abhinav was awarded the best PhD thesis award from IIAC Bangalore in 2017. So that makes you and us all proud once again. So after completing his, um, his PhD from uh, IIAC Bangalore, Abhinav moved uh, to London in 2017 at Birkbeck. And since then he is a postdoctoral research, uh, research associate at, at ISMB. Uh, and he is working with Professor uh, Waxman, Gabriel Waxman. And what I understand that he's working on the structure of the macromolecular assemblies, uh, mainly the ATPases and the other associated elements. Uh, the, that power that uh, the operation, those that power the operation of the type four secretion systems responsible for transferring DNA, including antibiotic resistant genes. So that is his, his topic today. So between bacteria during uh, conjugation. So, so the, the projects mainly involve extensive use of single particle cryo-electron microscopy, X-ray crystallography and biophysical chemistry. And of course, uh, today uh, you, uh, you were there with Professor Basu. Both of you are structural biologists. Of course, we will wait. Uh, we will definitely wait another day for Professor Basu to illuminate us with uh, the structural biology and related subjects and his scientific achievements. So today, now it is you, uh, Abhinav, to, it's the stage is yours and uh, you can share your slide and also you can share your, uh, a little bit of your experience with us. Welcome once again, and we are very proud to have you with us. So Thank welcoming you, Avinav. Yes. Welcoming Avinav. Uh, when it's a proud moment for us, when a student is becoming our colleague. This is the proud moment. When a student become a colleague, this is the most proudest, most proud moment for a teacher. And that is, you are there. So I saw you in 2008 to 10, also 2010, that time I was in IIC with Professor Balaram, that time you were there. So I saw after then also, and now it's very, very wonderful moment for me. And I'm really, I'm very, very happy to, because I know there was Jyoti, but after a long time, 2017, I, I, I think you left 2016 or 17. 2016, IIC, 2016 and 2017. 2016. Okay, yeah. that's why uh, last three years I couldn't see you. Yeah. Uh, I am just one thing. A uh, very Tageshwar. He was uh, Tageshwar was so, also. Uh, Tageshwar finished his PhD it, and then he went to Australia. To uh, he also did the with the uh, Abhijayan also. I think. Yes. So and then he finished his postdoc and came back and joined. Uh, NIT Warangal, I guess. NIT Warangal as a yes. uh, yeah. as an assistant. He's professor. senior to you. Yes. He's senior he to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why Professor Bijan talked to me and he gave me an example of Tageshwar and then asked me, he has actually confusion between two, you and someone with whom, I mean, who has to take he. Then he talked to me and I told, okay, you can take, her, uh, take him. So this is the thing. Uh, so one proud moment, again, the student become colleague. And uh, I also have one thing, like, uh, because this is also very uh, important uh, to know for especially for the students who are watching this, that uh, once we I had a chance to, um, to present our uh, department, uh, some, uh, some uh, projects before Professor Vijayan. And when I was, uh, when I was uh, narrating all the stories about the which uh, group of students have, uh, uh, we have with us in uh, WBUT. So, and I said that uh, we are from, uh, my students are from WBUT, you know, Professor Vijayan was so cool. And he said that, yes, I know, because by that time, all the students, a good number of students from WBUT MTech had moved to, uh, for their higher studies in IIC Bangalore. So it was really a proud moment for me at that time that, yes, there are so many students in the previous, um, the, that, uh, in the previous uh, years, that they had this um, this notion and this uh, aspiration to go um, to move to a higher uh, institute to the institutes of eminence. So this is one thing, and Professor Vijayan had uh, had remarked on that. So yes, uh, now Abhinav, I won't uh, yes. keep you back. Yeah. Okay, it's, the stage is yours. Yeah. First of all, let me begin by saying uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Badhupadhyay and Professor Banerjee, for inviting. You can me call me Jaya, ma'am. 
Yes, of course. The that user. is better. <laughs> I mean, this is more formal. So, that's, yes. so yeah, another I'm... thing is uh, uh, to thank uh, Professor uh, Basu for this fantastic talk. I mean, few of the things that he mentioned, actually, I didn't know. And just to see those slides and come to know about those facts were really enlightening. So I will share my screen now. Yes, please. Can you see my uh, slide? Yes, yes, yes. It's absolutely clear. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Abhinav. I'm uh, going to talk about understanding the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. So, so let me begin by saying that uh, this I, I, I try to keep this talk a bit personal by keeping a few photographs so that you can actually personally connect on how my journey has been beginning from how I started in uh, my M-Tech biotech batch of 2008 and 2010, and subsequently how it moved on later in life to- uh, That was your birthday, I guess? Yes, so this is the <laughs> first photograph of the uh, JNU M-Tech biotech uh, 2008 to 2000 batch, 810 batch, which I belong. Now, this photo is, I think, November 2008. So this is roughly 12 years ago. So, and yes, that Wonderful. was my birthday. That's why I am all- Wonderful. And just to give you a sense of, so this is was the JNU M-Tech uh, Biotech uh, batch of 2008. We were, I think around 12 or 14 people who uh, come through a national entrance and uh, get to study uh, M-Tech in biotech. Just to tell you that I would say out of the 12 that are shown in this photo, almost seven of them have did, uh, finished their PhDs successfully. So, so that itself it gives you a sense of the kind of things, the learning that you do in your master's in uh, uh, WBUT or what, I, what we call it Macout now, that really enables you to have solid fundamentals with which you can actually go ahead and you know, pursue higher goals in life. So that's something which I would like to tell uh, just showing. And one more thing which I wanted to tell you was this whole uh, batch of people come from a very diverse uh, places in the country from different states and different backgrounds, uh, something which was also quite fascinating. And you get to know people from really different uh, backgrounds and different states and different ways of thinking, something I still remember. You must introduce your wife. Yes, Go I'm back. coming to that. Yes. Sub subsequently, yes. <laughs> okay. So we were part of the larger uh, batch of uh, M-Tech Biotech uh, Bioinformatics and Integrated PhD students, all uh, probably shown most of them here. So this was, uh, I think, just a few, a collage of few uh, images of the bigger batch where we had people from both M-Tech Biotech, M-Tech Bioinformatics, as well as Integrated PhD. Again, I would say more than 50% of the people in this, these images have completed their PhD and are doing well in, in science. So that gets tell you that, you know, what you learn in your master's or in WBUT or Macout now really does make a difference. It, it enables you to, you know, move ahead in life in what you want to do. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, when you start in your master's into these places, you might think it's all work. Yes, most of our time used to go like this, sitting and finishing up assignments and uh, taking up tests and doing things, but then a lot of, and then also doing practicals. This is Professor Raja Banerjee's uh, uh, course, the uh, bioinformatics course. But then most of, in addition to this, we still had lots of fun uh, uh, time to do all sorts of things. Few of them are captured here. And often when you get busy or free or hungry, you can always go to the egg roll shop I don't remember the name of the shop now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just to have uh, recuperate. So yeah, and most importantly, uh, coming to uh, my masters, I also met my lady love in life. So, and we've been married for uh, four years now, but we know each other for more than 12 years. So this was a time which actually is something which is uh, very memorable. This is, her name is Deepika Hoja, and we recently also had a baby. Congratulations. Yes. 
And then another aspect which I wanted to tell was, I was fortunate enough to also know a few of my seniors who were incredible people, very successful in life, in science, and you know, multifaceted, and they are still doing really well in their lives and have been all across the globe. So this is also a few of our alumni who probably Jayamam and Professor Banerjee would be happy to invite in these kind of talks again. Absolutely. So this is the 2007 uh, batch. Again, most of them uh, have done their PhDs now. He did his PhD from uh, ATREC in Mumbai. He did it from Taiwan, I think. And then he was did it from Delhi. And yeah, Delhi, I think. And then he did it from GNCSR. And then he did it from ISC, from the same uh, department as mine. And also a few more. Wow. And then this was wow. our, uh, we gave them fable. Uh, so yes. that was the event and they are still preparing for a dance. So it was not just a study, it was a lot of fun involved as well. <laughs> this is Shafkat <laughs> who was sitting and preparing for dance. <laughs> yeah, this was our fable uh, picture. I mean, their favorite picture that we gave. So yes, in addition to that, there were lots of events, just to give you a sense of the life that we had in, uh, in our masters, it was, it was pretty fun and something would you like to go back to and you know, look forward to remembering. So there were a few of the events like the Aurora, which was the uh, a favorite event. So this so was you, a favorite you have event. a huge stock. What's that? You have a huge stock. Of I mean, it's, on, it's on slides which are pictures, so it's not a problem. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Real. So it's important to show the personal aspects. And, absolutely, you know, absolutely. Those memories are something that's the reason Very why. So <laughs> it is basically uh, learn with enjoyment. Yes. <laughs> so these Learning are some with of enjoyment. The, yes. So some of the farewell events that we had, this is Sean Ma'am uh, doing a Dancing. dance yes. every year. For sure, she will be in, in one of the events. This is one. This is in the next year, in 2009. She's also uh, giving uh, a performance. And then in addition to all those events, we also had other useful uh, things that uh, worked out well. One was the WBUT Alumni Association that we uh, uh, meeting that we did. And we called alumni, uh, old alumni, and we did a lot of uh, good talks and a lot of interactions, which was very, very useful in uh, orienting us to the right direction in terms of what we want to do in our career. And also the convocation and, as I said, the alumni association. And most of these events were in active encouragement and uh, participation by, with uh, uh, Jaya Ma'am, as you can see here, with her two young uh, kids. I don't know how old are they now? Now they are 17 plus. They will yeah, be 18 so very soon. Plus. So that's that's truly really something that I, I when I saw this image. I, it, this is five year old. Yes. And this was, I think, the picture uh, on the day when we went to like to an Bar outing. Yeah, yeah, Baruipur. Yes. But then we also had plans to go to Haringata to see the uh, building uh, being done. So that was, I think, 12 years ago. And this yes, was. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, almost, I think, 10 years ago. So yeah, these were a few of the images I wanted to share with you to show you how uh, the life was and how everything was uh, a few years ago. So in addition to that, we also did a few more things, interesting things which I just wanted to mention quickly. One was to uh, start a, 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 a magazine department. in the department mm -hmm. called uh, BioVariance. So this was something that was done, I think for two, two years, I think subsequently. Yeah, two years and then yes. it stopped. Yes. We missed so you all. As, as, as I mean, the uh, current uh, people, I would really recommend to uh, start it if it's possible. <laughs> so yes, this yes. is just to show you a few snapshot of what uh, people thought. Uh, also to show you who all were the older faculty in our department. Right now only, I think, Professor Jay uh, Banerjee and uh, Jay Padupadhyay and Professor Raja Banerjee are remaining. But most of the other, others also were there who taught us uh, really useful stuff. And also uh, Professor Jaydeep Mitra, who was the editor of this event. And then we also had a few, uh, you know, feedback questions, most of which are still very relevant uh, for people to ask in terms of improving the quality of the education that comes out to help uh, people to move ahead in their lives. 
So after that, I moved to uh, Indian Institute of Science, joining uh, molecular biophysics department uh, for uh, my PhD with this person called Professor M. Vijayan, as uh, Professor Raja Banerjee and Ma'am just talked about. And then it was a fantastic campus and fantastic seven years of my life in terms of both doing fantastic science and also knowing really great people and the overall ambience of the campus was just unbelievable, really. So what we did was we uh, did something called uh, X-ray crystallography, which is a part of uh, a wider field called structural biology, where we were trying to study uh, uh, protein structures for molecules called lectins, which are in central in uh, doing host pathogen interactions and plant storage and other roles. A few of them are mentioned here. So Professor Vijayan was also the first person to return uh, from abroad to start a structural biology group in India. And most of his people, I think I was his 40th PhD student and all the others, most of them whom you know now are uh, very big leaders in Indian science. The most prominent being uh, Professor Shekhar Mande now who is the director general of CSIR and also all the others. So after that, after a successful PhD, I would say in, in Indian Institute of Science, I moved on to uh, a university college London and a Birkbeck to an institute, it's a joint institute called ISMB, which is based in central London, where again, we what we do is, uh, so this is the uh, main building of uh, uh, UCL and of Birkbeck, and this is called SOAS, a School of Asianic and Oceanic Sciences. And that was the first place where Indian administrative service uh, people used to get trained. This was also the Institute of Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and other eminent people as well. So what we do uh, in Professor Gabriel Waxman's lab, who is here, is still structural biology, but on a much larger scale. While in X-ray crystallography, you are looking at individual proteins and individual uh, molecules to find the structure and trying to figure out how that works. But then when you are looking at much larger assemblies and motors and other subcellular structures, it's impossible to do crystallography because they will not crystallize. So the only way that you can study them is doing something called cryo-electron microscopy and cryo-electron tomography, something which I will uh, talk about today. But most of the uh, biological questions that we are trying to address using these techniques uh, associate with uh, secretion systems, which have a wide variety of roles. But what Gabriel's uh, uh, lab works on is mostly on type four secretion systems, which are important in bacterial conjugation. Bacterial conjugation is one of the oldest fields in science, I would say in biology. It's also one of the basis from where a field called genetics uh, subsequently emerged, bacterial genetics emerged. But then it's ironic that we still don't exactly know how in bacterial conjugation, DNA transfer happens from one cell to the other. Part of that is important in something called antibiotic resistance because one bacteria can actually transfer an antibiotic resistant gene from one cell to the other by a specific mechanism. And that makes the other bacteria also antibiotic resistant. And that's a problem that we've been trying to address for some years and it's getting more and more important in the society at large. So what we, as I said, we are working on is, uh, these are the uh, wider sections of uh, secretion systems that are there, which are two membrane, inner membrane and outer membrane spanning uh, massive uh, protein assemblies. And there are a few of them here, type one to type six. Now they are a type 10 actually. <laughs> this is only till six. What we work on is something called type four secretion system, which again is a, a two double membrane spanning uh, assembly, which has a pillar attached. I will show you uh, more movies, which will make everything uh, quite clear. This is just to show you that the structural aspects of uh, the um, uh, secretion systems, how they stand. So as I said, what we work on is something called bacterial conjugation, where this bacteria, for example, can transfer its plasmid DNA through an assembly called pillars and secretion systems onto the other. And then once that happens, that other bacteria can also be the uh, one which has the antibiotic resistance. This is shown in this figure, for example that it can transfer this DNA into the other cell through a massive uh, machinery here. And then the other cell also becomes antibiotic resistant. 
and why that is important is because it is causing a lot of uh, problems in the medical field now and people have been trying to wrestle with this problem for some time now so a type 4 secretion system can be a conjugative or a non conjugative one and it can also be classified on uh, other levels which is incompatibility uh, groups and other things so most of the genes for this uh, secretion system uh, lie together in an operon which here for example in this uh, e coli case uh, has around 15 genes 11 of them in one operon the other in another operon and then there are few more but there are three atpases which are involved which power the whole system to uh, transfer the dna so b4 b11 and d4 and as i just told you the type 4 secretion systems are involved in a wide variety of other actions some of which are stud well studied some of which are still being uh, characterized so what we do is as i said uh, we do structural biology on the type 4 secretion system so as i said this how type secretion system type 4 secretion system looks like so it is a double membrane uh, uh, macromolecular motor or a pump i would say so this basically has a inner on the it's situated on the bacterial inner membrane and the outer membrane while few of the components are in the cytoplasm and most of them some of them are also going out and binding to the other cell so in the past our lab used to do a lot of x ray crystallography to uh, solve the crystal structures of of individual uh, protein entities but it's really hard to visualize that in terms of the wider context of the molecules and see how that uh, comes up and works together as a as a motor so that was a problem until a new technique called cryo electron microscopy arrived where you could actually solve uh, structures of uh, massive protein uh, molecules in which are coming at much lower concentrations to much higher resolutions and then you can figure out how things happen so basically you have protein in solution which you can actually apply on a, on a grid which is basically a striated uh, metal bar and you can blot it and then you can vitrify the thin water layer which has the molecule suspended in it in a liquid ethane once you have the vitrified uh, sample you can put that into a, a microscope an electron microscope and then you can actually image them uh, uh, like this vitrified in ice and then you can collect images of uh, these uh, 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 data and then you can do a lot of processing this step is like a black box it's like magic but that gives you eventually the uh, 3d map or three dimensional map with which you can actually fit and actually solve the structure of a molecule so this for example was a game changer for looking at uh, molecules which are at very low concentrations and much larger in size and also complexes so as i said so the process was basically to have the sample apply onto a grid and then you blot it and you vitrify it once you have a thin layer of uh, ice which has your sample suspended in it you put that that grid into a microscope and uh, an electron microscope or a, a scanning transmission electron mic uh, transmission electron microscope and then you put it into uh, and then you collect images and then you process the data to generate three dimensional maps which you can fit to solve the x uh, crystal structure and um, to solve the three dimensional structure of the uh, molecules so until a few years ago this technique was still quite uh, difficult to do because in spite of all the sophistication you could not reach high resolutions with which you can actually uh, pinpoint the location of the secondary structure elements of the uh, protein and also the overall structure of the molecule but then there was something that happened uh, after 2013 it's called resolution revolution that happened in cryo microscopy because of the new detectors that can Uh, record the data and uh, advances in uh, image processing you can actually reach to much higher resolutions to resolutions of uh, comparable to x-ray crystallography and actually solve uh, uh, structures of molecules with very high confidence so this is something which was a game changer and for that most of the advancements that uh, happened uh, we here they got a nobel prize in chemistry a few years ago to three people jack dubosche which is in switzerland Joachim Frank and Richard Henderson who comes from uh, MRC LMB in the UK
So using that technique, we were able to, uh, in, our, in our group over the few years, we were able to solve a variety of structures. So this whole structure, I would say, looks like a pumpkin head on two legs in a way. So we were able to get the structure of the pumpkin head uh, to reasonably high resolutions. We were also able to get a low resolution structure of the overall assembly of the uh, uh, Type 4 system uh, in negative state. Subsequently, a few years ago, before I joined, the person whom I worked with, he solved the structure of the pillars, which is the appendage which is coming out here uh, at high resolution, and then also the machinery uh, below, which I will show you in a minute, and then one of the ATPSs as well. So based on the structural information, we could get info, and what I also quickly wanted to tell you that the whole uh, secretion system can work in two modes. One mode where it can actually transport the DNA into the, uh, from it to the other cell. And the second mode is called the pillus biogenesis mode, where it can actually synthesize the pillus and push it up uh, onto the other cell. And then when it finds the other cell, it can bind it and catch it and bring it close and then retract the pillus. So that's called pillus biogenesis mode. So I've been working on the ATP2, ATPSs, which work in tandem on top of each other to do the pillars biogenesis as well as substrate transport. So just to give you a sense of what the type of secretion system looks like based on the structural information that we have now. So this is the two membranes. These are the massive uh, different uh, assembly of uh, proteins, which are uh, compartmentalizing in different parts of the cell on the membrane, which come together to form this uh, uh, very nice uh, pumpkin head, which I just uh, described you is called the upper crown or the outer OM uh, part of the uh, complex. And the ATPases also come together uh, in the bottom to form uh, the legs of the pumpkin head and also associated uh, proteins which come together in the two membranes, which we will see in a minute. So yeah, so this is the overall structure of the type of secretion system which exists, however, this doesn't have a pili, which has to bind. So what happens is you have the individual uh, proteins which are transported into through the periplasmic uh, part of the cell, and then they are exported and a pilus is made. A pilus is like an injection. If you take an injection, there will be two parts. One is a base, and then you have a needle. So the base would be the type of secretion system, while the needle would be the uh, pilus uh, structure. And then this needle, can actually uh, you know, span out and then try and fish out any of its uh, uh, brothers, which it wants, uh, I mean, you can call it anywhere, which you want to basically uh, attach and transport the DNA. This is in real scale that you have tiny uh, secretion systems, which can actually fetch the whole bacteria on the other side, and then basically retract the pillars out to bring the bacteria closer uh, to itself. Once that's done, the system changes into something called uh, a substrate transport mode. Just I will show you in a minute. So as you can see, the pillus is retracting and the bacteria is coming closer and getting ready for transport. Once the signal comes through, what you can see is the plasmid DNA can come together with associated complex, something very similar to a DNA replication uh, machinery, which has helicases, primases, and other uh, components, SSBs which will come together and form this very nice and tight uh, 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 machinery, which comes together and gets recruited onto the typo secretion system with this protein called Tra-I, which is like a helicase in a way. And then once that happens, one of these uh, single strand of the uh, uh, plasmid DNA gets cleaved and then gets attached to the uh, relaxase and then goes through Yeah, there's some sort of covalent modification that happens. And then this whole uh, uh, uncoiled uh, protein, the relaxase, with the single strand of DNA passes through this uh, double membrane structure onto the other cell, as you can, uh, we'll see now in a minute. So this is basically now the uh, DNA, which has started the single standard DNA, which has started going through the uh, cell, the double membranes onto the other cell. 
So this is how basically uh, we, how we visualize the uh, antibiotic resistance mechanism works. Although we know most of the uh, structural components, we still have a lot of unanswered questions. For example, for the whole of the trichosecretion system, we don't know high resolution information for this part, something which we've been working for many years. And then in pillars biogenesis, as I said, there are three ATPases, two out of which sit on top of each other as uh, heterohexamers to power the system. We don't know the structure of uh, this part. We also don't know how this uh, DNA replication machinery like uh, assembly gets recruited to the type four system and interacts with it to uh, start the process of transport. So these are the few questions which we've been trying to answer in our group. But then these two I've been working on directly. And what I'm going to describe today is part of the work that we've been, we've been doing to get the B4B11 uh, complex using cryotron microscopy. Just to uh, digress a bit, we've also been working on something called cryo-electron tomography, where you can actually image the uh, hypothesis system sitting inside the cell on the double membrane using uh, something called a cryotomography. So as I said, what, been, what I've been working on is are the ATPases, uh, mostly two of them, uh, that are associated with pillars biogenesis and also powering the uh, DNA transport in the antibiotic resistance machinery. So these are uh, large uh, uh, membrane, uh, integrated membrane uh, ATPases. They have been very hard to get uh, purified in terms of uh, their active hexameric form as they have a lot of variability in terms of their oligomeric status. So we have spent a lot of years trying to figure out how to get uh, the active hexamers to basically study them. But the biggest uh, change that we did was to integrate it with something called the HCP1 which is a type six secretion system uh, contractile protein, which forms hexamers by itself. So when you fuse that protein with this and then you try to uh, purify in a construct like this, you can actually get uh, very strong uh, hexamers. This has been done before by uh, somebody called Wim Hole, who was the one who saw the structure for cholera toxin. And cholera toxin is something that uh, has been studied extensively, in, I think in Bose Institute. I think it was discovered in uh, uh, Bose Institute. That's what I remember. So what we do is we purify the whole uh, complex by a, a set of steps. And then you get a neat uh, band after size exclusion, which you can, or gel filtration, which you can put in negative stain cryo electron microscope to see how they look like. And you can see very nice uh, exameric balls uh, in, in the slides to tell you that they are very stable and nice to do cryo on. So by cryo, what I mean is to basically vitrify those samples as I showed you in the uh, animation before. And then you can actually have uh, those molecules embedded in ice, vitrified in ice, which you can collect images on. So this is one of the data that we collected on this uh, uh, sample. And then there were uh, lots of complex uh, processing steps, which I would not like to talk about today, after which you can basically get a three-dimensional map, which is the one that you can use to then build uh, the structure of the uh, ATPS. So this is for the B4 uh, ATPS. As you can see, it's a hexameric ATPS, and that's in uh, conjunction with the HCP, which is sitting on top. So there are two domains. This is the ATPS domain, and while this is the uh, larger domain which uh, forms the oligomers. These are the different views, the top view, the side view, and the, vert and the vertical and the bottom section, just to show you how they look like in the bottom. So the resolution was pretty high to be able to build it with uh, high confidence and figure out how they look like. As just to show you the overall resolution of the uh, three-dimensional maps are pretty good in except two oh, regions. Oh, Oh, yes. can I yes. can I just inter interrupt? Yeah. Uh, do you have some raw data of these structures? Because these are basically what you are show, uh, you are showing. Yeah. These are basically the uh, after analysis what yes. you are getting. Yes. So if you have some raw data, show them so because the they raw have... data. this is the uh, images of the particles as you can see yes. here. These are the particles which are embedded in ice in vitrified ice. This is the yes. raw image. And then once you have those images, and you can. I, I will be very happy 
if yeah. you just within two three minutes because rahul banerji taught you here and yeah. then you learnt a lot how yeah. from these spots how this from this spot you are going to that particular big structure yes uh, okay. that is if you just tell them this is also something uh, yeah. because that will be it will be very good from uh, to know it from a horse's mouth who has done the extra crystallography that is a very very um, uh, tricky thing so if you just tell a few words for them how this cryo em you are taking this thing and this from this big bigger spot you are going to that thing yeah. so, so if you yeah so basically what we have what we do is we have the uh, grids which have a very thin layer of ice in which the particles are vitrified as i had shown earlier in the animation once you have the grids which have the vitrified ice which have the particles in them but in random orientations then we basically put that grid into a, a, a cryo electron microscope transmission electron microscope called the cryos which is the one that we use to collect data and then you get these sort of images where these tiny dots that you can see here are the particles or the uh, protein which is uh, vitrified in different orientations in the ice now the question is how do you get the structure of that uh, from this so what we do is we pick those tiny spots as individual particles first as you can see the circles each circle represents individual protein which the program can detect from the ice and then it can extract out the information of that particle from the ice but then just that is not enough so what we do is you do something called a 2d classification which will basically superimpose all the particles which are of one specific orientation so here for example this is a side view uh, orientation one side view this is the like a tilted view this is like a top view so there are different views you can have particles which are oriented in different views so all the particles which are in one specific view will be clubbed together in one 2d class as you can see here different 2d classes in different orientations then what you do is you pick up the information and ask a question that this specific orientation is what angle in three dimensional space then once you have the information for each of the orientations you can put that together in one to ask how does the whole molecule look like in three dimension and that's how you get the three dimensional map which i just uh, uh, showed you in the next slide i hope that answers the question uh, reasonably i have still not to told a lot of details but uh, i try to simplify the whole process in a way that uh, people can understand so once you have this uh, uh, map you can actually build on it and then you can get the three dimensional structure which is the which is this uh, which is the uh, this uh, lines which you can see and which you get basically is this which is the three dimensional structure of the molecule which basically is a resting state hexamer which is not a completely closed uh, hexamer that we would like but because that can only happen in the presence of atp as you can see it's like a open flower because the uh, c terminal domains are panning out in and they are not really closed for the uh, molecules to work so it's basically a resting state hexamer which is a trimer of dimers and the oligomerization is mostly happening at the end terminal uh, domain so these are the few of the views just to give you a feel of how the protein structure looks like and how this hexamer is actually uh, together so what we would ideally like is a closed symmetric uh, structure because this is the structure which we know would bind the b11 the other hexamer from the bottom and then act as the more as the bigger machinery for uh, transport and pilus biogenesis so what we are trying to do is to somehow get a close hexamer and then also the structure of the b4 uh, atps with the b11 atps together so for that the first and most important thing is to figure out how the c terminal domain would close to form a close hexamer we had a few answers based on the previous structures and we also have preliminary data uh, based on which we can say that how it looks like because for the atps to close the atp binding sites 
of individual adjacent uh, molecules have to be in proximity so that one portion of the first uh, binding site is actually collaborating with the uh, next so this is not possible in this case because it's a it's an open hexameric uh, structure as you can see like an open flower like this but then what you can actually generate uh, by computational molecular dynamics a closed uh, structure with this which would basically be like that the the one which is shown in uh, brown which would have the atp binding sites which are adjacent binding sites being proximal to each other so that they can work just to show you how they will uh, work most likely would be uh, like a swivel motion which will basically close the uh, open flower into a closed form ready to bind the other atps in the bottom as you can see here Just close it. So once you have the closed structure of the B4 uh, hexameric ATPase, that enables you to put that uh, in context with the larger question, which is with the B11 uh, ATPase. The reason why we have been trying to ask this question is because we've been trying to figure out how uh, the substrate transport and pillars biogenesis machinery uh, can work. And for that, this question is quite central to be asked. And also, this is the first known example where two hexameric ATPases can come together on top of each other in two tiers and then work together to basically thread proteins and other uh, stuff through them. Something that's not known in nature and it's very novel. So this is the second ATPase, which is the B11 ATPase, which is called the traffic ATPase. We are expecting can also close and then bind at the bottom of the uh, B4 to form something like this. So this is again uh, right now a computationally generated uh, model. This has been done in collaboration with uh, a person called uh, Professor David Baker from Institute of Protein Design in University of Washington. This is his postdoc, which we have, have been uh, working on for a few years now. So with that, what you can actually do is you can computationally generate a closed hexamer of the B4 and B11, and then you can test that by doing something called coevolution analysis. So those predictions will give you overlapping uh, set pairs of amino acids between B4 and B11, which would co-evolve if they are in, in the same interacting surface. And then you can test that to validate whether the model is indeed correct or not. So I'm not going to show you that data, but I can tell you based on that, it works. And this is the correct model that we have for the uh, two tiered uh, B4, B11 structure. So just to uh, recap that, so once you have the structure of the open flower structure of the B4, what you can basically do is remove the HCP first from the bottom because that's our experimental uh, design part. You can then generate from this open uh, hexamer, a closed hexamer for uh, B4, which is the uh, brown one now. And then these uh, end, three terminal ends of the B4 can come together with B11 hexamer to form this two tiered heterohexameric assembly sitting on top of each other and threading a DNA and protein through this onto the other, onto that, to the structure to the assembly of uh, the TIFO system onto the other cell. So this is how we think the uh, bacterial secretion system works and how antibiotic resistance genes and other important plasmids are transferred. We also are working on experimentally to figure out how that uh, works. So to summarize, uh, we be, this is the first atomic structure of the uh, full uh, AAA ATPs. We be for from any system uh, solved in a resting state in hexameric form. And we've also been able to build the end terminal domain, uh, which is a novel fold, uh, and, but with poor biochemical characterization. And this enables us to solve now the larger structure of the full type of system with much higher resolution, something that I'm not uh, talking about today. And then uh, you can also then figure out how the transport happens uh, from one cell to the other in terms of the transport of antibiotic resistance gene. So these are the few things that we are trying to work out. And we are also trying to see if we can uh, get uh, uh, substrate trapped uh, complexes in which 
you can block the process at certain stages and you can actually trap the whole uh, secretion system transporting the DNA in it and visualize that whole assembly together. Something which would be quite fantastic to look at uh, in future. So I would uh, uh, finish my talk by acknowledging a few of the people with, with whom we've been working. Without that, it would not have been possible to do that. First is Professor Gabriel Waxman uh, from uh, Bergbeck and uh, UCL. And then Professor David Baker from Institute of Protein Design. And also Anthony Roberts and, uh, from uh, Bergbeck. And then Professor Stefan Rausner from MPI uh, in Max Planck in Dortmund. A few of my lab uh, colleagues, and then a few of my alumni who themselves have become uh, successful group leaders in uh, other institutes across the world. And of course, in the end, to uh, welcome Trust for the funding and the Bergbeck EM Lab for all the support that I've gotten to, to be able to do this. I would be happy to take more questions and thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Abhinav. That was a wonderful talk. And I think you have really steered a lot of uh, in interest amongst the students because I can see the chat box is uh, flooded with few questions. So uh, there, uh, we can read out or you can also go through them uh, before we, uh, we take questions. Um, also, uh, students can uh, ask a question by raising hands. So maybe we can go with the chat questions. Uh, Abhinav, can you see that? Yeah, I can or see it. Should I read them? them? Yeah. Not or should I read them? Yeah, could Ovinav, you read them? Yes. Ovinav, I yes. have a question. Yes. Uh, now I want to be your student. Okay. Tell me, uh, <laughs> what is the difference? How you face the difference when you are working with a cryo system and without cryo system, the same sample? Because sure. as you are working with this, so how cryo, now this world is called cryo world. So how the cryoprobe helps you to get the more diagonal part? That is... So, yeah. So what happens is uh, in the past, people, what they used to do is do something called a negative stain, uh, transmission electron microscopy image, which can be done at room temperature, where what you do is you apply a sample on the grid, but then you stain it with uh, uh, different kinds of stains. Something called a urinal acetate is what we use quite uh, regularly here. The problem is the good thing with urinal acetate is it gives you very high contrast and then you can really image it in room temperature, very nice and crisp images, as I've shown you in the negative stain images in it first. But the problem there is that the urinal acetate itself will form a massive layer on uh, like an envelope on top of the molecule. So you will not really get a high resolution feature uh, when you process the data. So the reason why then people end up using uh, cryo, which is doing uh, vitrification, where you apply the sample in thin layer of vitrified ice, and then you collect the data at, uh, at uh, uh, freezing temperatures, is to be able to preserve those features, which you can subsequently back calculate and trying to reconstruct. So that's the main motivation why people are doing uh, cryo, which is uh, doing a uh, low resolution, low uh, temperature freezing vitrification process. So that to be able to get high resolution features when you reconstruct them. I hope that answers my, your question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think uh, I, uh, students okay. can. Okay. So I so hope that you can see the students' questions and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, before uh, we take uh, questions from uh, um, um, Professor Banerjee or myself, I also have one or two questions, but I'll take them, uh, you can take them after you answer the students. Okay, yes. so um, let me uh, go through them. Uh, well, uh, okay. Uh, Debushmita Chakraborty, what's the importance of T4 SS uh, operon in human body with the T4 uh, secretion system in yes. human body? Yeah, so, so what happens is uh, the typhoid secretion system does not uh, exist in human body because the current uh, T4SS that I talked about exists in bacteria. And that's one of the main uh, systems which is import important in transporting uh, antibiotic resistant genes from one bacteria to the other. And that actually enhances its survivability. So if the, I mean, as it doesn't exist in the human body, so probably that's not uh, very relevant. 
although if the TIFO system does not exist in bacteria, I would say that it would be a major problem in its survivability because the kind of antibiotics that we have been, uh, humans have been using to counter those bacteria, the bacteria will not be able to evolve and uh, transport uh, those genes to its siblings so that they can survive in that uh, antibiotics. And that's especially important in cases like mycobacterial tuberculosis that we, you might have known things called uh, XDR TB and uh, you know, multi-drug resistant TB. So those are all systems where the mycobacterium tuberculosis, one of them which somehow by evolution had a resistance to those antibiotics that we've been using to counter them, is able to transport that to its sibling to, for them to survive. But if that T4S does not exist in them, they will not be able to survive the antibiotics that we are giving. So that's why it's quite uh, important. Yeah, there's another question from her. Um, if any problem occurs in the type 4 secretion system operon, then what will happen? So the, the siblings that they are, who are supposed to get the antibiotic resistance genes will not be able to. And then there are also cases where some of the bacteria can also secrete toxins into the human body, the cells, human cells, to kill them. For example, uh, just to give you an example, uh, in Vibrio cholera's case, the bacteria that causes cholera that we used to work on in WBUT as well. So what happens is if you, that works on type six secretion system. So in, in that system, what it does is it will not transport DNA from one cell to the other, but it would transport effectors, which would actually be secreted out by the bacteria onto the human cells and actually kill those human cells. So, and that's how the whole process of ADP ribosylation and, you know, the diarrhea that we see starts. Aritro Bhattacharya, he asks, sir, does the pillar, uh, pillar, pillars, I think it is pillars. Yeah. Uh, does, sir, does the pill, pillars proteins get translated in the base proteins or uh, do they get polymerized there? So uh, what happens is uh, they, they get translated in the cytoplasm and they get exported into the uh, inner, inner membrane periplasmic space. From there, they are imported or pulled in into the type 4 system to be assembled as a pillars and polymerized to form the larger uh, needle uh, structure that we talked about. And one of the, and that whole machinery requires energy. And that energy is powered by the B4, B11 assembly that we've been trying to uh, study and how that uh, energy transport happens. So uh, Debushmita asks again, is it size exclusion chromatography in case of TWRK? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, and after purification, means, yes. yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. What we do is we do uh, something called uh, septavidin related uh, uh, you know, purification, strep purification we call it. And then after that you can purify the complex further and make sure you have the right uh, uh, hexameric molecular weight using size exclusion chromatography. Okay, but she asks, them, what is the full form of TRWK? Yes. So, uh, yeah, so true K is the, so basically uh, the B4, B11, it has different nomenclatures. So in E. coli, depending on which type of E. coli you're looking at, which strain of E. coli you're looking at, the B4 is called differently. So there are some things called uh, uh, PKM101 strains, there are some, one of them called R388. These are all ATPAs. All no, ATPAs. These R388 and uh, PKM101 are different E. coli strains, oh, like BL21, D3, and then uh, the top 10 and DH5 alpha that we call. So in each of them, the B4 is called differently. So in the R388 strain, it's called True K, TRWK. And then it has, so the protein that I have is basically True K, which has a linker with the HCP, as I told you, because HCP will hexamerize the uh, my protein also into hexamers. Yes. As what's Reliant? So Reliant is basically the image processing software that we used to use in the past quite extensively. As I said, that once you have those cryo images where you have particles embedded in ice in different orientations, you need to first come pull them together, ask a question that which orientations are they from, and then pull all of them, those together to improve the signal to noise ratio. All these things are done uh, in image processing softwares. So Reliant was the one which used to be used earlier. Now we also use something called CryoSpark, which is 
quite powerful. Yes. Which one is more required in homo or heterohexameric assembly? Why heterohexameric assembly is formed? I think that's evolution because it requires uh, it requires two ATPases to basically thread the you know material through it. So basically, it's like two uh, assembly, and then the material has to go through from the bottom uh, up, and that requires uh, energy from two of them. Probably it works like a rent system. We don't know exactly to do the threading. So that's why you need the hetero heterohexameric assembly. And of course, you can explain why the cryo situation is required. That is definitely yes. you can explain. Yeah, yeah as, I, as I just uh, answered Professor Raja Banerjee's uh, yeah. question, yeah. that the moment, the one way you can look at is by doing negative stain, where you get very high contrast. But because of negative stain, it forms an envelope on top of the uh, molecule. And you lose all the high resolution information that you need to build the structure. So the only way to deal with that is to actually vitrify the sample in thin layer of ice where you will have particles embedded in ice in random orientations. Then, and the, then the whole thing you have to do in cryo, which is in much lower temperatures to keep, make sure that the vitrified ice remains frozen. And then you will image also in uh, uh, those low temperatures and then ask a question, what orientation those molecules are from. And then based on that, you would back calculate the three-dimensional structure. The softwares that you have used? In yeah, I think uh, most of them, so the initial data processing, the data collection was done in EPU software that it comes built with the cryos uh, in, uh, in Bergbeck. And then uh, subsequently you use Reliant, you use GeoToMatch, you use uh, CryoSpark and a lot of other tools depending on where you need it. And then subsequently you do the model building in Coot and uh, Reliant and other things and Phoenix. Oh, there's another student who has asked you that the difference, since you work in IISC, the mindset of uh, the scientists working in India and abroad. So what do you, how do you assess and what is your uh, That's a very interesting question. And I think it, it varies even abroad is also very diverse because depending on where people come from. So in the past, people used to say the culture, research culture in uh, the US is much more cutthroat while, and very professional while in the UK, most of the PIs and supervisors that you will get would have a personal touch. They will know you and then you will know their families. And it's it's more like very much in India, like where you know your guru really. And then you learn from them, but you also know them as a person and their abilities and other things. But then that has changed because depending on where people are coming from, which labs have been trained, they also tend to have that mindset. So it's, but it's hard to generalize. But in a way, I would say that the mindset in ISC was much more laid back. We strive excellence, but then the kind of problems that you are trying to uh, address are much, much smaller in scale because of many reasons, because of long-term funding support and uh, a lot of other uh, issues. But then what happens is the kind of training that you get in ISC is something I would not I have not seen in other places. So that's something that really is useful and it prepares you to be able to work on much bigger problems when you come abroad and you know, you're know you trying to address much more challenging problems. But the reason why they've been able to do that is because of the long-term funding support and extraordinary uh, uh, instrumentation abilities that they end up getting. And things work really fast because of that. So I think that's the major difference. Ovinav, I can add one thing. It is just a difference between a genomic and epigenomic. Yeah. The IIC environment is an epigenomic. Yes. <laughs> so which forces you? Actually, I saw a person, even uh, I went IISC first in 93, 91, sorry, yeah. after my BSc. Mm -hmm. uh, then in 93, 94, after MSc. Okay. That was that time I went for as a student. But the tower, the administrative tower, yes. that high rise, when you see, that will give you an impression in your mind that you are somewhere. And yes. opposite, there are two pine trees which are just like this. Yeah, bending. Yeah. And in between, <laughs> there is a Jamshedji Tata. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that is the environment, I think. What you are saying yeah. in the world is the epigenomics. Yes. 
so which you have that will help you to inculcate more what yes. gautam das says who you are yes i mean the strive to excellence <laughs> and strive to ask good questions and you to have the detailed training to be able to answer them is something that uh, we have uh, something i would look back from my isc that's so that really prepares thing, you to ask difficult questions one thing it is also you, you in kolkata or in iisc if you have you see two three nobel laureates are sometimes working yes. and taking in the prakriti with you as a coffee yes okay <laughs> i was finding one day benki is benki is after the getting the nobel he was working and just sitting uh, opposite side with me yeah. in that prakriti shop yeah, yeah. to take the coffee okay yeah, yeah. so this is something <laughs> inspiring you yes i think this is a very inspiration yes so see these great people actually yes. what gautam the told about the biva this was the physicist who, who was denied for giving a work a problem this is there is no problem for women quote and quote yes. and from that he now becomes the star yes and she <laughs> now becomes the star yeah so that is the thing and actually i'm telling you i was scolded by oshima chatterjee i told madam apni ki eta kore deben i hope you understand little bit yeah yeah of course i know bengali yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, madam ami to parchi na apni ki eta kore deben she said who madam the way she started talking me and her daughter julie benerji was beside me she told me call her master that was the first time in interaction so there is no gender biasness yeah. there is no caste whether yeah. you are from don't take it otherwise where yeah, yeah. what is your general or whether it is a, this is on the science that matters yes and i am telling you people do not know gan chandra ghosh who is the biva as you were told they have missed the nobel prize yes. gan yeah, chandra yeah. ghosh people know he is the director of iit kharagpur director of yeah. iisc bangalore but he yeah. is the key man who helped to get the nobel prize by dibai hukel because he yeah. considered your problem and the solid phase that the electrostatic interaction that's why he put a cube root and yes. what that dibai hukel has done he put a root over 1 by 2 <laughs> and that was the only factor that gave them chances of nobel prize i mean you uh, there is in this platform what i would also like to say is that the reason why i started the uh, in biophysics and subsequently in structural biology is Uh, was primed by the discussions and the classes and the training given by professor raja banerji and uh, professor okay. rahul banerji this is quite embarrassing no no it is this not is... embarrassing <laughs> it is true so, so that whatever is... is true he is speaking his heart he is yeah, speaking yeah, his heart true. out yeah <laughs> so so that's something i would again probably look back to and you know remember and, uh, and i'm i'm so telling you avina uh, i am telling you when i started my phd you know i missed yeah. with professor balaram due to a postal mistake yeah, yeah so you know the story so that time only the iisc was doing the structural biology yeah and once gautam basu came in kolkata he was like something which is completely different from other set of the people yeah so he started the crystal that is not the uh, crystal gravity he started with the solution structure and the structural biology field here yeah. in kolkata so that is he was the pioneer in case of the kolkata who do what the thing you understand the iisc helped you to make who you are yes. because be, how many times you saw your bijuan say uh, telling you and how you will be after tell your friends tell your seniors how you face mane when you go enter to into the room of bijuan from your lab to his room how you are give, becoming afraid feeling to, yeah yes yeah he is not he is yeah. not somebody very easy to deal with now i'm i'm extremely sorry last yeah. 2019 when i went there he was so he was yeah. uh, suffering from disease and well, now yeah. actually yeah. Uh, that is a very but how the ages are doing this thing but uh, yeah. in 2009 even i was little bit oriented to enter into his room yeah everybody is oh, that time i was a faculty uh, the, the current uh, dgcsr you asked uh, shankar narayanan the mm-hmm. uh, the chief scientist in uh, ccmb you asked rahul banerji for that matter yeah. they will tell you the same thing i mean everybody yeah. is quite scared on because he precisely so, knows from the numbers what what so to do so that's why that's why you think 
it is better entering into bijan's room better to think your problem once again think and already find the answer yeah. and then go to him yeah yeah <laughs> otherwise it can go anywhere from there <laughs> yeah so that is the training that is yeah. the training that will help you to make yourself and that please tell this is my word also yeah. the word uh when i did my phd i did my phd in kolkata now i am telling with this gautam da so because i was not but what i understood and i think you also appreciate and dr bondabadhai also we are learned not to over express not to pretend only to concentrate yes. that is the thing only to concentrate your problem and that is the thing you will see the world you might also know that the first person who started cryo em in india uh, the atomic level cryo em is uh, somebody called somnath datta yeah he he also started he is phd from bose institute and then joined the institute of science almost around the time when i was about to leave so there are lots of people who are doing good work and what i also for the students who are uh, who are joining in this session what i would like to say is as you can see that most of the time that we had as students in wbut and the education that we got especially the basics of each of the subjects that all our teachers were able to uh, put in us that really helped us to have solid background but you can do anything you want with that solid background i come i used to come from an engineering background i did my uh, btech uh, and then i i was planning to basically be in the industry which is because that's something naturally that comes to it but then once you have the uh, information and the background that you get from your education in in wbt or macau now you can actually do anything that you want you can either be in industry but if you want to do further research you can do that and then apart from that you can also do other uh, skills uh, i know that one of our batchmates who uh, is a broadcaster in doordarshan now this uh, anind roy do you know yeah but he's a broad i didn't know i didn't know yeah, yeah. okay okay that's good to hear what i mean to say is that the kind of skill that you get and the attitude that you get in terms of learning from the institute here you can actually do anything with it and the way you are be, you will be trained you will be most likely succeeding in whatever you are doing but it's important as uh, gautam basu said earlier it's important to follow your heart and ask a question that what do you really want to do and whether whether you are satisfied doing it or not and if you are you should just follow it and in the end with the training you will get you will uh, succeed there uh, that Dr. is Jaya actually Bhai. yeah that is actually more important because that's what uh i try to emphasize to the newcomers because they have the first question that uh, that uh, what is uh, what is the placement you know these are the questions even probably you also had in your mind and my yeah. only one belief is that that uh, see first get your uh, education first get trained automatically your your vision and your mission will be in ahead of you after the two, one and half after one and half year immediately you know where you stand and what is going to be your goal so i think it's too early for somebody to decide what is going to happen after two years and i think it you you students were also at that time you were also having the same question yes. but it is good that the training actually uh, steered you to uh, to follow some and embark on to something which your heart wanted i think yes, and i would also like to add that uh, coming working in eminent institutes in india and then abroad especially in india i would say that and so basically when you go there and you know that there are few institutes from where you get people from masters who are really good and in, in when they join for phd i could name a few for example tejpur university pondicherry university university of pune our university comes in that and people know it most of the uh, eminent scientists in india who work uh, in the academia they know they knew wbut i don't know whether they will know macau or not but they knew wbut and they yeah, know you are right this Absolutely. coming from wbut they know that they will be good at uh, that uh, course so that's something it's it's lot of heritage and uh, reputation that has been carried down through the years and all our alumni most of us a few of my colleagues few of our seniors 
all are in different places and doing good work in all sorts of uh, diverse areas. So something you can look forward to doing in future. I, I can also see another add, question there. I, uh, yeah, there's a. Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, yeah. I just yes. want to add a top up. Yeah. Okay. So the thing is, as per my understanding, I think the um, movie Three Idiots. If I think that is the best movie I have seen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm, uh, me, my daughter, and my wife was uh, were working some Hathi Bagan, and she was saying, hey, hey, uh, we, we must go to that, see this picture. And she yes. just told, took us to that. Yes. Okay. And that word I learned don't run behind the marks, the, let the marks run behind you. And yeah. this is the thing is, if you concentrate your study, if you learn, if you understand your things, actually, automatically there is no questions will be uh, turned unturned. So yes. you have to answer all the questions and automatically if you, but if you go for a, something made easy type, it will be very difficult. Yes. And I think in IISC, here people are saying after four years, sir, when we will get the PhD. But I think in IISC, even after five years, you people are very much in a mood. You do not know whether we will ask, sir, sir, when can I submit? Yeah, that, 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 is, what... yeah, that is good and bad in different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah I understand. I, I really, I really the good thing is the level that they keep. For example, in my uh, group, Professor Vijayan, until yeah. you, he has a strict criteria of four first author papers and in yeah. selected journals. Until unless you don't cross the threshold, it can be yeah. two years, it can be five years, it can be ten years. But you are not so, leaving until that's done. So, so that's when you are doing a when you are doing a master, that means you are master. Yes. But when you are doing a PhD, that means you are a doctor. Yes. Now, so you must have to cross a threshold. Yes. That means so many things you have that doesn't mean that you will get the PhD. But yes. once and until that time you crosses that level the barrier, the threshold, you will yeah. not get the PhD. And you yes. people, I know very well because now I am a visiting and faculty in that position. Yeah. So even this, you students are quite afraid to see, sir, I have seven years. I have no uh, uh, fellowship. Sir, please sign in my, but here the students are crying. Sir, sign it, sign it. This is the thing we are doing this thing. So yeah, yeah. and I, I, you you also know how many times in a week you can see the face of Bijan. Yeah, you yeah. can see he is so busy. He is yeah, the yeah. founder member and the in so many meetings and so many things like that. So this is something I think, and I am requesting Dr. Bondopadhyay. She is again in charge of the biotechnology department now. I think we should make a meeting with the. Uh, with such of the uh, alumni one day. Okay. And just we have to tell how we can improve. What is the earth? I think uh, as Avinav, I can... Yeah, we, I am I planning can, to can, do that, right. Yeah, I am requesting Avinav because he has so many th things. I, I, You show a picture with a speck. I, uh, he was sitting uh, just... Uh, you show the first picture. Uh, the guy with... A, he, he was also from Kerala. Yeah, uh, I no, forgot. Uh, I forgot, but your senior, most probably. Uh, that is Vijay. Vijay, Vijay. Uh, maybe. Guy, Vijay, right? maybe. But he is also. He was also student. the CR. Like Abhinav was the CR of uh, his team, uh, his year. Vijay was the CR of the previous year, of the and class. Vijay is very yeah. good. Yeah, Vijay is also in one of the really good labs in Israel in, now. In CSR, right? No, no, he finished his PhD there. He finished his PhD now. Then he is in Israel now. He's in uh, oh, right, right, right. also finished uh, and he from the uh, at Trek. and then, then he, has he moved, moved on to Barcelona to do Barcelona. Uh, and then moved to uh, US. Yeah, now he so is in I, US. I, 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 may I request this is one now, question. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, may I request Avinav if you can just do a small group because yeah. Dr. Bandapada is more, uh, she's. I, what you know, I am using the word, don't uh, take it personally. She's crazy about the, her students. Yeah, yeah. She's <laughs> That's crazy true. about her students. <laughs> not like me. Undoubtedly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, mean, I think, yeah. I think we I mean, should I mean, meet yeah. one day. We yeah. should meet one day with the uh, 
2009-2010 batch and can you take this pain to do this thing get their numbers and do yeah, this yeah, thing we can we can so what i would like to tell you there is that uh, people who used to work with uh, jm in the past the uh, 2007 batch that is vijay uh, shaktar kumar all these guys and then we we uh, talk regularly still yeah so we always have a chat and then i was talking to vijay and then i was telling him about this and he was quite excited uh, to know yeah um, because we are going to plan and yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then i was telling him one day one day we will, will see it together we have also some plan and we want to know how it can be because yeah. now you are seeing the world yeah you are now seeing the world and you are working with the great people yeah this is the thing actually when we also went outside we learn something but there yeah. is no doubt the potentiality here only yeah. the potentiality difference is the, the mind setup i'm yes. telling you yeah the people who are working how many are in uh, in iisc more than 50% are bengali students and in the yeah, interview to both people are people, yeah people are waiting people are waiting for this and so, what i would like to say is that i mean bengal because of the institutes and very long uh, culture in doing science as well as arts as gautam bhasu yeah. said science is also arts so it has the a very culture and tradition of, uh, and very good solid background in science coming from raja bazar science college and you know other uh, institutions in the country iacs you might know i don't know whether the students here know that indian institute of cultivation of science yeah. and iisc started together almost at the same year right as an institution right. but then just because of the funding support and the situations now they stand very differently but then the 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 fundamentals that you get from many institutes that are there in uh, calcutta and bengal in general are really really good professor vijayan used to say that calcutta is his second home yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but, okay. yeah vijay uh, sorry abhinav uh, yes. there's one question which is very much similar to what i would have asked you Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have a name anonymous so yeah. now we have to find a drug which can halt this mechanism of sharing yes. so the time of antibiotics uh, medication antibiotic resistant genes sharing can can we stop means uh, yes. actually the drug yeah what is so the effect the whole, of the drug the whole point of doing this is to be able to first figure out how the structure of the molecule and the whole pump is then the next question you're trying to ask is how does that really work and then you are asking what are the key elements that if you target and generate drugs against will actually stop the pump to be and then it will not be able to transport the antibiotic resistance genes onto its siblings and that would really as he said would help uh, you know combat this epidemic of antibiotic resistance that has been uh, you know coming up more and more especially in india in case of M mtb and others that we know So, uh, Abina, what about what is your view? Uh, are are these uh, systems these uh, um, systems like the T four uh, type uh, four systems? Are they very much uh, similar or across the bacterial group? I yes, mean, uh, what about the? They are all same, right? So, so the mechanism. For example, uh, if you see, uh, so in terms of generally talking about all secretion systems at once, most of them I would say work fairly similar. They will have an assembly a massive assembly which is spanning both the membranes and then pointing out and they will also have the atpases which power the system this is quite common but some most of the atp most of these systems will have only one atps because they are fairly simple except the and most of them because they only transport uh, proteins like a channel you know through from yes, one side yeah. to the other <laughs> so they don't need that much uh, sophistication except the type 4 where it actually requires sophistication to be able to pump the dna and that's the only machinery which actually transports uh, dna and it transports not in outside but onto the other cell but in general in terms of their overall organization in the membrane i would say they are a bit similar but you can pull them together in one form yes and uh, the last question uh, i can see sir how Aritra asks, "Sir, how to establish a multidisciplinary approach towards the subject we are learning?" That That's very good. good That's a very good, good question. question. Yeah. And it directly brings me to kind of things that I have been doing. Yeah. So, 
I would just uh, try to answer it in my perspective, and probably that could resonate with how you think. Yeah, yeah I guess so, so. I mean, what I started was as an engineering student because I liked maths, but I also liked biology. So that's something uh, I wanted to do, which would involve both mathematics and biology. The reason why I started with engineering is because that's the place where you can actually build uh, mathematical models for biological systems and actually test them depending on what you are uh, doing with it. So that was one part of uh, multidisciplinary approach that you would probably establish. Subsequently, when I did uh, my PhD, the reason why I started doing in uh, molecular biophysics and in structural biology was again because although you are using, although you are answering important biological questions from a structural standpoint, the way you are asking them is using, for example, in X ray crystallography, using uh, X rays and using scattering and using electron uh, biophysics. That is something, again, which is multidisciplinary because you are using physics, you are using mathematics and trying to ask biological questions based on the instrumentation and the computation and programming skills that you would bring in. So as you can see in this uh, scenario, you have, you need programming skills, you need an information of physics, you need mathematics to answer biological questions. So you also need to know the biology. So that's again, one level of multidisciplinary approach, uh, you know, just to give you an example. And subsequently now coming here again, when you are using the microscope, the electron microscope and trying to collect images of your sample, what you're essentially doing is using optics and again, mathematics and you know nuclear physics to be able to again, ask biological questions. So these are a few examples to tell you that in the past, I would say 60 years ago, maybe eight years ago, people used to have distinct areas called biology, physics, they are working on physics, they are working biology, they're working mathematics. But in today's day and age, to ask any sort of question in any field, especially in biology, you would need to have a multidisciplinary approach which would require knowing uh, things from other fields as well. And that's very central. And that's something you can't avoid. Exactly, yeah. And actually, uh, this is the time when the student is enrolled into uh, some uh, program, some uh, yes. uh, course curriculum then that make that individual segment of the of the curriculum like the subjects they actually must be uh, must be uh, taken with seriously yes and uh, and if you are there with your basics i think uh, then the rest part can be taken is can be taken care of and and your life also becomes much easier to yes. uh, to delve into any problem uh, with, with which you want to embark upon i think yes most important thing is you have to be very clear on your basics. Yes. So and as, I think, uh, I mean, part of this question as he asked that, how do you establish a multidisciplinary approach to subject what you're learning? The first thing that you should be looking at is to be able to learn all the subjects irrespective of what you like it or not. Well, because exactly. once you do that, you will have strong fundamentals on each of those subjects. Then after that, you can ask the question that which is the subject you like and you want to pursue. But it might be that in future, when you're pursuing that subject, you would need some other subject which you had studied. But if your fundamentals are not uh, strong in that subject, you will not be able to do well in the area that you want to work. So it's very important. And that is something probably that uh, we get trained well from uh, the masters, which I remember, I mean, yeah. And what is your feeling? How a biologist should know mathematics? He should know math. In this, as I said, in this current day and age, he need to know mathematics, he need to know programming, he needs to know physics, all these things. And that's critical, especially in the fields that, for example, I am, without knowing mathematics, you can't do anything. Because the moment people start asking, how does the electron microscope work? Or how does electron scattering work? They will go back to mathematics and differential calculus. And if you don't understand that, it will be all in thin air. So if you do not know how to convert the Cartesian coordinate into the polar coordinate, yeah. because you have to do. Yes. So to... most of the people, I, I think you should tell these people because we are the old and the, uh, the young students when see you, people like you, because you are just still in UK or USA. So people think, yes, you are the current age of current man, current ages. 
man yes. of current ages yes so what you were saying is basically these people are thinking we are taking biology because we do not like mathematics yeah that is not the thing yes now people are i i told you what my feeling is those people those people the biologists are now using biology as a platform where they have to play yesterday i was talking to a statistician of a presidency college and he was saying the same thing the biology and mathematics is now they are complemented i will and just uh, briefly describe one point there is uh, something called alpha fold which has yeah. made news uh, globally now this is to solve the protein folding problem so yeah. the person uh, who used to work on that was from is from deep mind which is uh, based in uh, london so which is uh, which was acquired by google subsequently so google deep mind is the one which has uh, now they claim to have solved the protein folding problem so the guy who used to work on the protein folding problem now in deep mind used to before work on uh, voice recognition so all the on your phones when you speak and you know on uh, and then it recognizes and tries to do uh, whatever to tell you the uh, right results so he used to develop those tools before that he used to do image processing so in this current age when you need to ask specific questions especially important in biology when you are trying to ask the kind of sophistication the kind of instrumentation in cell biology for example as well if you want to ask those questions eventually you will end up in a technique which would be very strongly based in physics and mathematics and until as unless you don't understand those points properly you will not be able to appreciate the intricacies of those uh, fields and then subsequently be able to understand what your data tells you all it might be biological data so it's very important to be able to know mathematics and physics in addition to biology and also programming skills as i just mentioned So, yeah that was uh, really you you whatever you have shared today will definitely um will be taken seriously i hope it is taken seriously by the students but we we are not going to scare them at the moment because they're just uh, fresh birds and uh, there's a long journey uh, uh, we, they are going to now go through and uh, they are just few days they have been able to interact with us we are still struggling with some platform through which yeah. we can take classes as you know that we we are now still in that lockdown kind of uh, phase yeah. and we have not been able to uh, go to the campus so we have to be happy with the online mode of teaching which yeah. uh, which should be uh, quickly changed to the to the physical mode and i think then only the entire fun of uh, Uh, science and education and studies will be there without which i think uh, tyagesh was i was speaking to tyagesh few days ago in yeah. nit warangal where he is mm -hmm. uh, faculty now they are saying they are completely switched to uh, classes online classes completely yeah so that's that's what we have to do it but how so do you with... feel the feedback is because you, as gautam uh, sir said it's in, difficult to see the students and Understand no, we we okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. I, 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 am, I am telling you. I, I am yeah. telling you. A teacher of more than twenty six years of experience. Yeah. I am telling yeah. you. When you give a talk and that creates a question in the mind of the listeners, that yeah. means you are successful. Yeah. And yeah, uh, and also to add to this, uh, there is a link. All of you students, you must see. There is a link. A uh, feedback link. and of course uh, this will be also recorded this is this is going to be in youtube also so you can okay. all get to hear it we have the youtube link also and the feedback link all of you please take down the feedback link which is there in the chat box and please post your feedback and of course your feedback is very important because this will only help us to think again that we should have these type of sessions more and more and uh, definitely we will keep it a my uh, keep this um, in into our minds that our alumni will will surely uh, be an integral part of such sessions yeah. other than the science uh, scientists that we will in, invite but our our students are doing excellent excellently across the globe and i think we should invite them first and then motivate you so that we can go ahead and feel proud there is also one more thing i would like to mention here that is that uh, there is a joke uh, in isc at least for people coming from uh, wvt is that What? they will only be pre engaged with somebody who would be from 
<laughs> because it's it's more than six or seven uh, couples I know. What, uh, not even seven. Ten couples I know. <laughs> On a lighter note, yeah. everybody will enjoy this part. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so that. So that. So that's also something you can very, look very, forward to as students. Funny. This is very funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is true for Devojyoti. This is true for you. This is true. For... There are many more. Many, many more. Many, many more. more. Ten many at least more. I can see. Ten so, couples. So, so you can say in this way, the education is one kind of marriage. Yes. <laughs> education is one kind of marriage. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to think about with whom you will stay for your life. Long. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Abhinav, we are. I'm really thankful, though, as a teacher, I don't know how yeah. much. I, I, it's very. It, it reminds me of our days uh, yeah. uh, during that time, twelve years back. But your candid remarks were really candid. was something different, and I really appreciate it. And I think the students have enjoyed the yeah. lecture. Uh, the scientific part definitely for the for the fresh birds, it would be a little difficult. But nonetheless, you will try to learn more. And uh, Abhinav is there. Uh, I can share his email ID with you if you want to uh, uh, interact with him as you have already started with Debo Jyoti. And really, it would be wonderful to make a team uh, with you all. And yeah. it is wonderful. Thank you so much, Abhinav. Yeah. And Thank you very much, also Thank you very much, on, on our be behalf. And actu actually, I am giving you a, uh, what can I say? It is a task or it is an enjoyment to yeah. just make your friends together. We yeah. will sit one day and yeah. I, I want to listen. And um, uh, as also your uh, madam is here. So we two who are the oh, two old horses. She is yeah, the yeah. first lady uh, and I, I joined after there in 2004. Uh, so we are taking because yeah. I am so old. That's why I cannot leave. And she was <laughs> so she is so affectionate for my couch. Yeah. That's why she cannot leave. Yeah, and uh, okay. actually Vijay is also working in the protein folding problem still. Yeah, he works Vijay. in a lab which is a protein folding lab in uh, Wiseman. Wiseman? Yeah. Uh, Israel. Israel. Joel Sussman? Uh, no, not Joel Sussman. Uh, the, uh, he's a... What is his name? I forgot now. I will uh, probably tell you later. Actually, actually okay. I'm telling so, you, in 2006, Joel Sussman... I met Joel Sussman in SINP. And after yeah. my poster, seeing my talk, and after seeing my poster, and after my talk, he offered yeah. me. Okay. But that time Israel was so, he told me, don't be afraid. 50% time in the year you will be in Israel, and 50% time you will be with me in USA. But yeah, my, uh, yeah he's, I, he's from uh, Dan Tofik's group. Yeah. So this yeah, so, is just to tell my students, tell our students, this is what you are seeing today. It is a true life. We are not here to making you scared. Oh, here we are not making you to uh, give, uh, make you afraid, but it is a true story from where the horse's mouth you are listening. What is the current area? What is the current craze of the world? Okay, okay so, so be last, prepared for that. Yeah. There's one question before we wind up uh, because yeah. I think many students are facing problem with the data. So uh, Molly Mukherjee uh, Abhinav, uh, she asked that I like maths, physics, because this is just a question it arose out of the discussion we had, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, as well as bio biology. But sir, what is the significance of physics in bio field? Okay. Is yeah, really I mean, it's very yeah, significant. Uh, uh, for example, yeah. uh, in crystallography, when I used to do all the uh, details of diffraction and other things that you talk about, right. diffraction, grating and scattering comes from physics. In uh, electron microscopy that I do, all the optics in the microscope and the way electrons travel and then subsequently hit your sample. And in the end, also uh, show you the signal is all based on physics. So yeah, so, physics and maths are very badly intertwined, unfortunately or unfortunately. And now biology is also very uh, intimately is associated with that. No, that's good. So this, is, this was wonderful interaction, interactive session we had. And thank you, Abhinav, uh, okay. taking all the time because you had to you had to reschedule your microscope work. I believe uh, no, that's fine. That, that and, was, uh, and also was pass <laughs> pass my regards to uh, Deepika. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It would be uh, good that we can have her also next time. Yeah. And on behalf of uh, the School of Biological Science and the two departments we have, the biotech yeah. and the bioinformatics, I uh, once again thank you very much for. Uh, 
for um, uh, accepting this um, invitation to talk yeah. before our students. Yeah, and I also thank uh, the entire, uh, all the all the students who were there, many of them have, must have left because uh, they have these issues of an internet problem, you know. Yeah. So we are still struggling with it. So it was, um, yeah. so I also thank all the students who were here to listen to Abhinav's uh, lecture and Professor Basu's lecture, which was the earlier one. And uh, I also thank um, the webinar team and university and the webinar team, Prem Kumar is there, who is, uh, who is uh, working for the entire, all the webinars, he's the person behind it. And Shoham is there, our student, just a pass out student, Shoham. Okay. He has, uh, he has prepared all the flyers, taking all the trouble, making the flyers and all. And of course, our vice chancellor, I take this opportunity to thank him also because he has always uh, been encouraging in uh, holding such a webinar. And we are happy that we've been able to bring our alumni. So we will keep this legacy going on because yeah. I'm very proud of my students and I will keep this going on. And with all your best wishes uh, for us and my regards and my blessings to you and your uh, family, uh, we will uh, definitely uh, keep in touch. And also thank you, Professor Banerjee, for arranging this uh, sort of um, induction orientation program for the students. It was a good idea that we are, have, uh, that we are uh, inviting our alumni. And I think uh, our purpose of, in, uh, 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 for uh, orienting our students has been to some extent uh, fulfilled. So thank you very much. Thank and very much. Uh, it, it is a uh, good evening or good night. I don't know if you are just, uh, yeah. good afternoon, maybe. Good afternoon. afternoon. Evening. Yeah, I'm okay. preaching lunch time now. <laughs> okay, so okay, good thank night you and so thank just you very one much. Announce, one announcement, uh, the yes. next Monday, the next okay. Monday, we will have another this kind of webinar where another eminent scientist and now a director of a CSIR Institute will be here to present. Okay, so this is, I am telling you, the students to you and also a place I find uh, almost a half has left uh, because of maybe someone is writing, there's a data problem is there, I know. And uh, from several, another thing you have to attend in the university platform is there also. So my uh, request is to you all also be present on Monday 5 because he is also a scientist who started from very scratch and now the director. Okay. So that Arun is the sir. Arun sir, Arun sir. Uh, okay. okay. Don't uh, <laughs> No, Abhinav was asking. So. <laughs> okay. Let, 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 answer, answer him. 